สวัสดีค่ะ Good morning, all delegates, and welcome to the online seminar on carbon capture and utilization toward carbon neutral economy. I am Dr. s u p a r v a d i n a m u n g r a k a researcher from Nanotech, and today I will be the moderator for the seminar. Before we start, let me give you some information about the attendance of the seminar to ensure that the seminar will be running smoothly. First, each speaker has 30 minutes, including 25 minute talk and 5 minute Q and A. During the seminar, please mute your microphone if you are not speaking. If you have any question, you can send your question into the chat box, and the chairman will help you ask the question. Or if you want to ask by yourself, please raise your hand by. Clicking on the raise hand emoticon below. And now is the time to start. May I invite the executive director of Nanotech, Dr. w a n n i Chin s i r i k u n to deliver a welcome remark. Please. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. สวัสดีค่ะ All distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this special seminar on a very important topic: carbon capture and utilization, or CCU, toward carbon neutral economy. As we are well aware, climate change is one of the most pressing crises of our lifetime. With the current CO2 at atmospheric concentration of more than 400 ppm. And an average global temperature rise of 1.1 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial era. The impacts of climate change are affecting people from all walks of life: drought, heat wave, and flooding, all examples of extreme weather events that are wreaking our ecosystems, jeopardizing our food security. Endangering our health and well-being today and in the future. According to the most recent Global Climate Risk Index, Thailand is one of the top 10 countries most affected by the climate change. Well, to refer to reverse this miserable or unwanted forecast, Thailand pledged at COP26 to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 40% in 2030. And to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, and net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2065, with these very high aims in mind, Thai authorities, industries, the public and private sectors, as well as our scientific research communities, must commit to developing ways to decarbonize our energy industry, agricultural. And transportation sectors as soon as possible. All these pushes are key for the ambition our world urgently needs. Among all existing decarbonization technologies, carbon capture and utilization is one of the most essential tools for converting CO2 greenhouse gas to marketable carbon-based products. The implementation of CCU technology. Not only cuts global CO2 emissions, which can lead to low carbon society, but it it will also establish a new carbon market, which is projected to be worth as high as a trillion dollars by 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, here at Nanotech, we have teams of researchers who are extremely dedicated in developing sustainable solutions to climate change. And CCU technology is one of the top priorities in our research policy directions and efforts. I am so delighted that today we can bring together so many like-minded researchers who are pushing the boundaries of research in the CCU technology, as well as the representative from our industrial partners, whose missions on sustainability are at the forefront of the Thai. Private sector. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like 
to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation to our international guest speakers today. Professor Deng Song Chang, Shanghai University. Professor Bun Siang Yio, National University of Singapore. Associate Professor Ki Yung Min Choi, Suk Miang Women's University. Dr. Chu Sing San, Longi Green Energy Technology Company Limited, Shanghai. Our chairpersons and speakers from leading Thai University and Nanotech, Dr. Krajon Sak, Phuong Nawakit Nanotech, as the chair in the morning session. Professor Meta Jaron Panit, Kasesat University, our chair in the afternoon sessions. And um, Associate Professor Thong Thai Witun, Kasesat University. Associate Professor Patra Pon Kim Lo Sun Thon, Jularongkorn University. Dr. Pusana Hiransit, Nanotech. And also speakers from our industrial partners, Dr. Butra Buliang, SCG Chemicals, Kunarichon Pokawat, PTT Exploration and Production Public Company Limited. Today, I am very confident that we will not only learn a lot about exciting avenues in CCU technology from both technological development and industry perspective, but we will also strengthen our relationships, which will hopefully lead to stronger collaborations and fruitful advances in CCU technology development, of course, in the near future. Finally, I believe this is a proper time for me to mark the opening of this seminar, online seminar on carbon capture and utilization toward carbon neutral economy. I do wish you all a very fruitful day filled with productive discussions and success for our seminar today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wani, very much for the warm welcome. Uh, next, may I invite Dr. Kajon Sak Phuong Nawakit, the Director of Nanocatalysis and Molecular Simulation Research Group, to share the morning session. Dr. Kajon Sak is one of the leader of the carbon capture and utilization research in Thailand. Uh, please welcome Dr. Kajon Sak. Um, thank you, Dr. Supawadi. And um, good morning, everybody. Um, of course, um, thank you so much, Dr. Wani, for your inspiring opening remarks in, in this morning session. And, and I think now that the session starts. And before we start the, the session, so I would like to make sure for audience, so um, please um, be sure that your microphone is mute during the talk and, and you can leave your question or comments in the chat box all the time. I mean, during the talk, you can leave the message and I will collect all the questions for the, the, the speakers during the Q&A period or maybe um, during the wrap up uh, period. And um, so today morning session, we will have uh, four speakers, um, nine speakers in total, but for the morning session, we will have four speakers. And it is our honor to invite Professor Deng Xiong Chang from Shanghai University, China, to give the first uh, presentation today. Um, Professor Chang received his um, PhD from Shanghai University, China in 2007. And of course, he is a world-renowned expert in the field of nanomaterials and catalysis for environmental applications, especially for NOx reduction and dry reforming of methane. So his work on the confined catalysis, I mean, confined catalyst structures is very well known. And he received a number of, of, of national and international recognitions. His current age index is more than 75 and total citation is above um, 15,000. I think maybe it reached um, 20,000 soon. And the title of his talk today is Carbon Dioxide Reforming of Methane Over Novel Catalyst. And the floor is yours, Professor Cha. Okay. And you can start. So you can start sharing the, the, the presentation. Okay, I share my my presentation. Yes, please. Uh, uh, 
Okay, can you see it? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wani, Dr. Kajosa, and uh, Dr. Sivawadi uh, to invite me to join this annual conference. And uh, it is my pleasure to be here to share our recent results on carbon dioxide reforming or medicine of a novel catalyst. Okay. Yeah, uh, currently uh, we all know that uh, global warming impacts everything from energy use to water availability to crop productivity throughout the world. And uh, you know, global warming is uh, already being associated with increases in incidence of severe and extreme weather, heavy flooding, and the wildfires. Uh, you know, uh, that destroyed homes, dams, transportation networks, and other facets of human infra infrastructure. And uh, to date, uh, uh, you know, climate uh, scientists have identified uh, 15 tipping points that affect the balance of the Earth system. Uh, unfortunately, nine of them have been awakened due to the global warming. You can find that green, green land, ice sheet, you know, you can find ice loss accelerating. and. Uh, here, fine and the pace are changing. Yet, you can Amazon for rainforest uh, frequent uh, droughts and uh, and so on. The nine critical points known to have been uh, breached in, in the world now cover almost the entire planet. And uh, this is a uh, global greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions, which is uh, related to the uh, global warming. And uh, you can find that uh, and carbon dioxide uh, possess 76% uh, percentage totally. And the other most important uh, greenhouse gas is methane, which is about 16%. Uh, Carbon nutrition is an inevitable way to deal with the global warming effects and uh, which can solve environmental problems and uh, return to the harmonious relationship between man and the nature. It has been uh, recognized by us all in this planet. A uh, comprehensive reutilization carbon dioxide and medicine is of great significance. This special reaction, carbon dioxide reforming of medicine, is one of the hot spots in the current energy and the environmental research field. You can find that we can utilize it to synthesize syngas, which can be used for chemical synthesis for energy use, use in various fields. That means by using this reaction, we can uh, decrease the emission of greenhouse gas, and we can use it to fabricate chemicals and energies. However, this reaction has some issues to be resolved. resolved. You can find that this is the main reaction yeah, theoretically or ideally, carbon dioxide reform methane, and we can get syngas, uh, carbon monoxide, and uh, hydrogen. However, you can find that side directions are always uh, close. We can find coking over the catalyst which will result in the catalyst deactivation. 
and currently considering activity and the cost a nickel based catalyst is of most promising candidate for the carbon dioxide reforming mason. However, the severe coating and the sintering issue is regarded as a grand change and uh, challenge. It is very hard to resolve and uh, which restrict the practical applications in the in the factories or in the industry, you know. So uh, scientists find ways to, to resolve these issues and uh, uh, various strategies have been have been developed. For example, here, you know, you can find that they would like to enhance the metal support interaction, inhibit the dissolution of carbon, improve adsorption and the activation of carbon dioxide, or utilize the redox support to provide surface active oxygen. By using these strategies to to decrease the side reactions to resolve the coating and the sintering issues. However, you know, it is still a big challenge and it is very hard to, to, to resolve this, these issues. And here we find a, a, a special ways to resolve these issues. We using the confinement effects to improve the performance for carbon dioxide reforming medicine to inhibit sintering or coating. Here we uh, develop a metabolic confinement uh, catalyst and the interface confinement catalyst and the defect confinement catalyst. And we develop a series of high performance catalysts for carbon dioxide reforming mason. And finally, we restrict the sintering and inhibit coating. And finally, improve the stability of the catalyst. And, uh, and to propose some uh, uh, technologies for the practical applications. Uh, I will give. Uh, the uh, our recent progress in in this field to share our recent results here. First, we utilize the metabolic confinement effect to enhance the uh, dry reforming medicine by using carbon dioxide. Here we develop a metabolic confinement catalyst. Here, you know we we uh, introduce nickel catalyst in some uh, metal porous materials like uh, uh, alumina. Yeah, we introduce nickel in the channels of metal porous alumina. And then we also develop some yorkshire catalyst. That means this is a, a yorkshire structure. Nickel was uh, immobilized in this structure and uh, and uh, outside is uh, is a shell and uh, this is a metal porous silica and uh, we also introduce the nickel in the metal porous silica and uh, this is a silica actually is a metal porous silica spheres you know they have a very high surface area which can react uh, easily in the in the, you know, these uh, gas reactions. And uh, we also develop some aerogel catalyst and uh, with the mesoporous channel and uh, nickel can be introduced in this channel. Actually, we develop a lot of, uh, you know, mesoporous uh, structure materials, which can be used as a catalyst with mesoporous confinement structure. For example, I give you an example here. Uh, this is a nickel nanoparticles in metropolis silica. And uh, actually, we using uh, polio as a new delivery uh, conveyors and uh, removable carbon templates. Uh, you can find that we use uh, metropolis materials as a matrix. And then we use this uh, isolin glycol. Uh, as a, a delivery conveyor 
and uh, actually use a uh, dry in vacuum and uh, Nichols precursors will go inside the channels of the metropolis silica. And uh, after carbonization, the ethylene glycol will be, will be carbonized and uh, finally decarbonized these particles will be immobilized on the on the nanochannel of the metropolis silica. And also, you know, uh, because the ethylene glycol carbonized and the decarbonized, they will have the, you know, they will have a room for the reactions. And uh, this is the uh, catalyst with the confinement structure. And uh, I will show you the data for the performance. You can find that and uh, actually after we using this ethylene glycol as a conveyor and the nickel particles will go inside the, go inside the, the nanochannels of the metabolic silica you can find that the stability of the catalyst is highly increased and uh, coking is is much less than that of the pre you know, traditional, uh, you know, supported the catalyst. To improve the carbon dioxide reforming of mason performance, and uh, we also employ some, uh, some agents to, uh, to, to modify the framework of the nanochannels. Here we improve the MO. To, to modify the framework of the mesoporous uh, silica. And we find that the coating resistance is further increased. And uh, uh, we also investigate the reaction magnets by using in-situ lama and in-situ XRD. And uh, we find that MO species anchored on uh, the mesopolis silica contributed to the variation between uh, MO oxide and uh, MO, uh, uh, MO oxygen and the carbon. This is a, you know, this is a new compound. And uh, they have the dynamic conversion between M MO oxygen and the MO oxygen and the carbon. And this dynamic, uh, you know, conversion can ensure the dynamic carbon removal and make sure no coking uh, formation during the reactions. Yeah, here we just uh, in, uh, employ the uh, nanochannel or, or mesopore confinement to, 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 to improve the, the coking uh, coking resistant performance and uh, actually at the same time the single uh, uh, resistance can be also improved. This is our uh, uh, first example. The second example so we utilize the interface confinement effect to, to enhance the carbon dioxide reforming of Here you know we uh, you combine the nickel, uh, magnesium, aluminum mixed oxide, nanoprase, and the mesoporous, you know, silica together. And you can find that we, we employ these nanoprase and the most porous silica. We can confine the nickel particles in the interface between uh, nanoprase and the mesoporous silica. It is very interesting. You can find that nickels combined here. They also have the room or have the pause for the reactions. And uh, actually the gas can diffuse in the interface easily. Yeah, you can find that this is a comparison between, between the interface confined and the traditional uh, supported uh, uh, catalyst. This is a traditional supported catalyst. This is an uh, interface confined to catalyst. You can find that nickel particles, yeah, the, the size is highly decreased, is, is restricted. The growth is highly 
restrict. You can find that it's just uh, around uh, 10 nanometers. However, for this, uh, we are increased during the reactions more than uh, 14, 14 nanometers. And uh, also the metal support interactions were enhanced. This is the data for the catalytic performance. You can find that the corrosion and corrosion of uh, methane and uh, carbon dioxide was improved. And the side reactions was suppressed, especially the, the catalytic stability was enhanced. You can find that it is quite stable for this reaction. However, for the traditional one, the uh, activity is decreased uh, with the time on the screen. You can find that, yeah. And uh, we also check uh, check the TGA of the spin catalyst and uh, and uh, uh, some other uh, like TPO. Yeah, you can find that this is uh, the 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 catalyst the design catalyst actually is you can find that uh, the coking amount is uh, negligible. E negligible you can find that however for the traditional one the coking amount is very high than that of the confined confined the catalyst and uh, this is an area for the for the carbon formation you can also find that this the co coking amount is less than that of the supported catalyst and uh, uh, except uh, the, uh, the 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 mix oxide the nanoplates, uh, someone will argue that uh, because the nanoplates is not that stable during the high temperature reactions. So we try to find some uh, highly so more stable, you know, uh, supporters to employ it as the as the interface for the reactions. Here we find, you know, he uh, hexagonal uh, foreign nitride is uh, an ideal choice. And uh, foreign nitride, you know, uh, is very highly thermostable. And uh, yeah, and uh, is chemically inert. And uh, uh, you can find that uh, we, we, we just try to, to support nickel. So on the surface of the foreign nitrides. However, you can find that uh, uh, nickel particles increase easily on the surface of the foreign nitride. Uh, however, coking is uh, suppressed on the surface of the foreign nitride. Uh, that means this, uh, this surface is good for the, for the restricting of Coating formation, but uh, uh, but uh, you know, sintering resistance is an issue here. <clears throat> yeah, you can find that nickel particles easily glomerate on the surface on on the on the boron nitride. Uh, it is easily understood, you know, because the surface is chemically inert, so nickel particles easily agglomerate actually over this surface. So here we, we just employ the mesopolis silica on the surface to confine nickel particles <clears throat> over the uh, boron nitride. Yeah, we fabricate, uh, yeah, this is, a, uh, we, is the developed catalyst and uh, uh, you can find that we employ the, the Boron nitride uh, uh, plates and uh, mesopolis silica surface together, and uh, we we can combine nickels uh, in the interface of between uh, boron nitride and the mesopolis silica. And uh, uh, this is the, the 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 structure we have demonstrated uh, as we designed. And uh, we find that uh, this catalyst is quite stable. Yeah, uh, you can find that. 
Uh, this is nickel supported on silica, nickel supported on on boron nitride. Uh, the 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 corrosion is decreased with the time on the string. However, uh, for this special catalyst, you can find that they present yeah excellent stability during one hundred hour you know DIN process. Yeah, this is the the scheme. Yeah, this is a special yeah combined effect that have been. Uh, Demonstrated by us. Yeah, except these uh, these examples, we also develop some other you know uh, special uh, interface. Uh, here, actually, we employ uh, yeah uh, boron nitride uh, surface and uh, uh, let uh, LDH you know derived mixed oxide uh, surface together. Yeah, this is a mix of Mix uh, oxide surface and this is the boron nitride. We they have a spatial interface and we 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 find that nickel confinement in this interface also presents excellent dry reforming performance. Yeah, you can find that this this spatial uh, interface can you know. Uh, Possess both merits from uh, boron, boron nitride and mixed oxides together. Actually, uh, this is the uh, dry reforming uh, yeah performance. You can find that the carbon dioxide corrosion and the mesa corrosion is quite stable. Yeah, and uh, this is the comparison for the coking coking amount you can find that without the this interface the coking is a still a big issue but for this side the coking uh, amount is highly decreased uh, yeah uh, uh, except this one we also yeah developed some other uh, catalysts except the mixed oxide we also employ some Real also oxide, uh, uh, yeah, to to confine these uh, uh, nickel uh, particles between the interface of uh, a boron nitride and the real uh, nanoparticles. Yeah, this is the uh, cerium uh, cerium oxide. Uh, yeah, uh, cerium oxide is a very typical, you know, uh, and uh, actually low. Low cost uh, rare ore oxide, and uh, uh, we employ this surface in the, you know to 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 support nickel nanoparticles, and then we on the surface we construct a boron nitride surface. You you can find that nickel particles confined between nanoceria and the boron nitride. And uh, you can find that the uh, the the dry reforming performance is also increased. Yeah, that's the this catalyst is quite stable as compared with only you know the serious supporting the nickels without boron nitride. You can find that yeah, uh, and uh, the this you can find that uh, the carbon easily. Of course, on the on the serious supported catalysts. However, for this you know uh, interface combined catalyst, uh, yeah, just less carbon formed on the over the catalyst. Uh, similarly, we develop the zirconia and uh, being interface combined nickel particles. Uh, yeah, quite. Quite similar, and uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, this is the nickels between the B A and the zirconium. We, we just I I just show you some examples here. Uh, you can find that the dynamic balance of carbon formation and the removal suppressed the carbon accumulation over this uh, catalyst. 
This is the second example where we uh, utilize so the interface confinement effect to enhance the uh, carbon dioxide reformulation. Finally, I'll give you uh, another example uh, on the defect confinement effect, you know, for enhance seeing the catalytic performance. Just as I mentioned, being is a very good supporter for the nickels for the dry reforming mason. However, you know, this surface is chemically inert and the nickel particles easily agglomerate. And uh, how to uh, enhance the interactions between nickel and the boron nitride? Uh, it is uh, uh, actually, it's a very good idea, right? So here we introduce the defects. And actually, uh, by using the DFT calculations, we find that the interaction between nickel and the BA was enhanced by introducing defects. And uh, also the mason adsorption uh, capability was also improved. By, by introducing defects. Here, so uh, it is an issue how to introduce the defects for the boron nitride. Here, actually, we develop a, a lot of ways, and here we, do, we employ the bombing techniques to, to, to construct the defects over the surface of the boron nitride. And uh, actually, uh, this is a uh, is a boron nitride. And uh, after employing for for milling techniques, you can find that the the sheet was uh, peeled and uh, which is quite stable in the uh, solutions. That means uh, uh, the layers was highly decreased by using this strategy and also because we also using the urea here and which can react on the, with the surface of the boron nitride which can which can uh, create the defects over the being yeah you can find that uh, uh, this defect can confine nickel particles yeah because this defect is uh, quite uh, reactive, just as uh, we calculated by using DFT, uh, uh, DFT techniques. And uh, uh, the nickel particles were so highly improved. Uh, this uh, has been demonstrated by some uh, yeah, TM uh, techniques. And uh, the side reactions was also inhibited most important, you can find that the catalyst uh, show the enhanced stability as compared with that without the defect. Yeah, this is a defect confined catalyst. This is a without defect, highly improved, right? And the more important, you can find that this is the uh, being without defect, uh, coking is a big issue. Sintering is also a big issue. But for this one, sintering is uh, suppressed and the carbon deposition was also restrained. And the TGA also demonstrated this result. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, employ the theoretical simulation and uh, experiment, we can find that, uh, yeah, the interactions between metal and the support was enhanced significantly. Uh, yeah, I will not, not give you details. If, if you are interested, you can read these papers. And uh, we also employ uh, DFT calculations and uh, uh, institute drifts to demonstrate that uh, smaller uh, size the nickel and the defect size synergetically promote the adsorption and uh, commotion of reactants. And more importantly, we find this special uh, BOH species were beneficial for these uh, uh, reactions. Uh, except this strategy, we, uh, we also develop some other ways to 
to construct uh, the defective uh, boron nitride. Yeah, here, you know, we uh, employ uh, this uh, uh, sonic, uh, sonication techniques uh, with the alcoholysis, and uh, this can react with the boron nitride of the, especially the age, age size will react with this, uh, with the aid of the sonication. Yeah, this is the scheme for the, for the formation of the defector being. And uh, you can find that this special uh, uh, defect, def defective edges of the B Byron nitrate is also favor for the confine, confinement of the nickel. Yeah, you can uh, you can find that the particles can be uh, can be restricted. Yeah, just around uh, uh, five to 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 eight eight nanometers. However, for this one, you can find around uh, several around the 10, more than 10 nanometers, right? And the defect confined catalyst shows smaller nickel particles and uh, also shows the stronger interactions. And uh, uh, yeah, this we also checked uh, uh, this, uh, demonstrates this vacancy is the B terminated defective ages, yeah. Uh, this uh, we check the, the the defective edges type, and uh, we find that this catalyst exhibit uh, excellent activity and stability. Right here, more than one hundred and twenty five hours is also quite stable, and the coking amount is is very very small. Right. Uh, and for this uh, traditional one is uh, much higher than that one. And the particles, you can also find that the particle size is uh, not, is, is uh, the, the increase is suppressed, right? And the, the coating, you can find that this is a traditional one, coating is a big issue, but for this one, we didn't find the obvious coating actually. And uh, we actually employ the drifts and lama to uh, to to find that the activation of uh, meson and the carbon over defect was enhanced. Finally, uh, I just uh, uh, give a short summary here. And uh, actually, the effect of the confinement structure was demonstrated to promote carbon dioxide reforming meson. And uh, the inhibitory effect of the combined structure on the coking formation was revealed. And uh, actually, we developed a, a, a series of catalysts by using the confinement structure and uh, a proposal and a key technology for efficient carbon dioxide reforming mission. Uh, that's all. Thank you, uh, especially. Thanks our partners from Nanatech, uh, Dr. Kjosa, Super YD Center, and uh, Sarah Wu. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Chang, for your um, excellent talks. Um, very interesting. So um, we have a um, question from the floor, uh, Dr., uh, Professor Patra Pawan. So thank you very much, um, Professor Chang, for your interesting talk. What is what is important factor in controlling um, CO to hydrogen ratio in dry reforming, as the ratio is important for further conversion into various chemicals of fuel. So, so the, what is the important factor to, to control the uh, ratio of, of CO uh, hydrogen? Yeah, actually, uh, very important, you know, is the surface modifications. Actually, being is low cost, however, previously, you know, scientists didn't find that it is a good choice for the dry reforming. Uh, process so the modification of dry reforming and uh, to 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 come uh, to 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 construct the spatial interface for the nickels is quite important for the reactions uh actually 
some other agents to modify the surface of this inter interface is also very important, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, we may get more information from, from uh, your publications then. And then if if uh, we have some more questions from the floor and, and if professor can, can be available during the wrap up time so, so we can have more questions. And uh, let's um, join me to give a round of applause to Professor Zhang again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we are moving to the next talk um, from Dr. Su Xing Sun from Longi Green Energy Technology Company, uh, Shanghai, China. So as I think everyone knows that the Longi company, it's, it's, it's one of the, the, the number one, I think, solar uh, power technology in the world. Uh, Dr. Sun received a, a PhD from, I think, Georgian University. And, and actually he has many experiences in, in uh, different uh, institutes like Shanghai Chao Tong University or University of Queensland. And uh, at the moment, she's a research scientist at Longi Green Energy Technology. Dr. Sun has long experiences on photocatalysis and you know, photoelectrocatalysis. Her research works on graphene, titanium dioxide, and, 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 and nanophotocatalysis are outstanding in this field. So uh, it is our honor to have her giving a talk on, on the, the conversion of CO2 today. So now that the floor is yours, um, Dr. San, please. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Fang Nawaki. Thank you for your introduction. And good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to join this wonderful online meeting next 2020. And thank for Dr. Fatbury's uh, invitation and Thank for the organization of these uh, of the host community. Uh, today, I'd like to share with you uh, something about uh, my uh, project related to carbon dioxide. First, I'd like to give a brief, brief introduction about my research experience. I started my PhD degree in Zhejiang University and focusing on photocatalytic reduction of carbon dioxide. I went to uh, the University of Queensland, Professor Lian Zhongwang's group in 2015. Uh, that's where I meet uh, Dr. Batbury, and we did uh, uh, we have the chance to finish a project together. Then after my PhD, I did two year postdoc in Shanghai Jiao Tong University and one year postdoc in Michigan Technological University in the United States. At this period, I participated in main three projects related to carbon dioxide conversion and also methane conversion and water spilling. Then based on my research experience on water spilling, I have the chance to join Longji company they are now uh, they are now not only doing solar cells but also doing uh, water spilling for hydrogen production. Today, I'd like to share with you uh, this project: converting carbon dioxide into valuable carbon materials based on alkaline metal chemistry. Actually, this project was started in Professor Yun Hanghu's group in the year of two thousand fourteen, and uh, so what I'm gonna and uh, share with you uh, many of the work done by my colleagues. Um, to realize carbon neutrality, carbon dioxide are now being convert converted in uh, major nine ways, including four reductive way and five non-reductive ways. Uh, via these uh, reductive approaches, we have obtained uh, carbon monoxide, formic acid, I think as no, these are very valuable products. However, these products are mostly liquid or uh, gas, so they have to be purified and stored in a certain container. And as a supplementary approach, we can also convert carbon dioxide into valuable solid carbon. This requires, uh, because the product is solid, so 
uh, less further processing is needed, and we can also achieve carbon negativity if the products are not burned into carbon dioxide again. Uh, however, due to the uh, inertness of carbon dioxide and the difficulty to control the property of the solid products, this process is currently very challenging. Like um, just now, Professor Deng Song Wang, uh, uh, Deng Song Jiang has mentioned that coking will form on the transition metal catalyst. And that's one way we uh, uh, convert carbon dioxide into carbon. But that pr pr process only takes place in a very uh, small kitchen, and only little carbon was formed on the catalyst surface, and the reaction cannot further uh, process because the carbon will. Uh, form that will stop the reaction. However, alkaline metal is a very special one. Alkaline metal is the first group metal in the periodic table. It only have one electron on its outer shell of its electronic structure, which makes them very active. Also, they have very low melting point, meaning that they can be turned into fluid at a slightly elevated temperature. With a fluiding uh, metal, we can continuously obtain uh, carbon from the carbon dioxide. As we know, the reaction between alkaline metal and oxygen and water uh, has received them, and we know them a lot, and that's why they cannot be stored in the air. However, the reaction of alkaline metal with carbon dioxide has received less, less attention. Um, so we decided to uh, focus our study on this one to see if we can obtain valuable carbon material from the this reaction. First, we propose three reactions of the uh, alkaline metal and the carbon dioxide. We found that actually the Gibbs free energy changes and the LCP changes of these three reactions are all negative meaning that the reactions can take place spontaneously at standard temperature and the reactions are all exothermic. We also suppose that if the reaction can do take place, take place the process may like this, at a certain elevated temperature, the alkaline metal will turn into liquid and once it gets in touch with carbon dioxide, an intensive reaction will take place with the simultaneous formation of carbon and carbonates. The simultaneous formation of carbon and carbonates may result in a particular structure as we shown here. Uh, and after, after removal of the carbonates by washing, we may obtain this fascinating ordered 3D like carbon material. If the wall carbon wall is thick enough, we may even obtain 3D graphene material. And due to the rich oxygen amount in the precursor, we may get a lot of oxygen functional groups and defects on the carbon wall. These are quite desirable for many applications like energy storage. Based on this, uh, Yes, if we can obtain such materials, their application are various, including um, energy storage, sensing, photothermal conversion, thermal management, and absorption. Based on this wonderful evasion, so we started our research on this process. As we know, lithium, lithium because of its smallest atomic size and high ionization energy and hydration enthalpy, it shows the strongest reducing ability among these metal alkaline metals. So we started our research with lithium. Um, our experiment is uh, like this. We put lithium oxide. Lithium is a uh, solid at room temperature. We put them in a special crucible made of a lambdan and with a copper liner. The copper liner is very important to uh, 
have a good disperse, uh, dispersion of heat during the reaction process so that the crucible will not break during the reaction. And then we put them together into a furnace tube. And then we seal the tube, vacuum, vacuum it first, and then we introduce carbon dioxide to a pressure of about 50 to 60 PSI. Then we seal the reactor and elevate the temperature to about 500 to 600 to elevate this process. We will normally keep the reaction for 12 to 48 hours. What we can get after this reaction is a very black and hard solid. This one actually is composed of uh, lithium carbonate and a small amount of uh, lithium oxide. This is uh, just what we expected in our uh, the previous mentioned reaction. Also, the black ones are carbon, but we cannot recognize them uh, in the XRD because they have low crystallinity. After um, um, all this uh, product is very hard and black, once we drop them into water or acid, it soon we will get a very good dispersion of black powders. These black powders are just our carbon, carbon materials. Uh, this is the picture of the carbon material we, we obtain from lithium and carbon dioxide. They are like cauliflower fungus, and the layer thickness is very small, about six graphing layers. So we call this material 3D cauliflower fungus like graphing. Also, we found there are rich functional groups and effects on this, uh, on these carbon products. Also, uh, we found that the ratio of the oxygen in this material will change with the change of the reaction temperature. By uh, increasing the reaction temperature, we can decrease the oxygen function groups and we can uh, to some extent to increase the surface area of this material. Also, the sheet resistance, which we use to reflect the conductivity of this material, will decrease with the increasing uh, reaction temperature, meaning that a higher reaction temperature is beneficial for the conductivity of this material. As we can see here, this uh, material possess a sufficiently high surface area and a sufficiently high conductivity and with a lot of functional groups. These properties are very uh, desirable for many energy storage applications. And one of the energy storage at that time we are interested in is dye since it has the solar cells. And that's in the year of 2014. Now, uh, little, not so many people are uh, doing this part of research. But at that time, this is a very popular research. The counter electrode normally a, a, of the SSC is normally platinum. And we need to use it for the reduction of iodine 3 minors to iodine minors. And we hope this material to have a high surface area, sufficiently high conductivity. And we also want it to be cheap, not as cost as the platinum. So we can see uh, the material we uh, mentioned just now from the lithium and carbon dioxide reaction it quite just meet these demands when we used that for the count electrode of these SSCs we found we got pretty good results we got a uh, power conversion efficiency of eight over eight percent this even exceeds that of the platinum count electrode. These results make us very excited and um, keep our research. However, as as I mentioned earlier, we want to we want um, the reaction to have this kind of 
all the structures carbon materials, but the ones we obtained from lithium, lithium and carbon dioxide is more random. We get, uh, we suppose this may be because lithium has a relatively high melting point. Which, um, that means it needs more time for it to turn into liquid. In contrast, sodium and potassium shows much lower uh, melting point. Also, its abundance is much higher on Earth. So later we used these two materials to instead lithium to check if we can get more other carbon materials from their reaction with carbon dioxide. Here, this is the carbon material we obtained from potassium and its reaction with carbon dioxide. As we can see, this material is much more uh, organized than the previous one. This is just like a honeycomb. So we call this material as 3D honeycomb-like graphing. This material shows a much higher surface area compared to the optimum one of the previous reaction. Also, the oxygen amount is also higher, meaning it has richer active sites. Also, the sheet resistance is much lower, suggesting it has a higher conductivity. When we use this, these materials for, um, uh, for the count electrode of sensitized solar cells, we obtained an increased power conversion efficiency. For sodium, we also got a very different carbon material. This material, it shows a layer thickness of about two to five graphene layers and a medium surface area, not as high as the one obtained from potassium. And the conductivity is also among the ones uh, obtained from lithium and potassium. However, it's Oxygen function group is the highest. Um, interestingly, when we use this material for the uh, disensitized solar cell, we obtained a very high power conversion efficiency of about 10%. This is a leap of about 2%. This is a very high. Um, we suppose this is mainly contributed to the oxygen function groups on this material. Also, we suppose the oxygen function groups on the uh, different materials should be different. Because we've got uh, a very good result from the reaction between sodium and the carbon dioxide. So later on, later we did more work on um, this reaction. By varying the reaction conditions, for example, we also obtained a methyl channel carbon nano wall material from the reaction between sodium and carbon dioxide. The particular difference of this material compared to the previous ones is that it has a much higher uh, wall thickness, about eight nanometers. This has exceeded the ten graphene layers, so we call just call it carbon nanowalls rather than graphene materials. And they are, uh, but though the wall thickness is high, but it also have a very decent surface area and a very high conductivity. The strong structure and the high conductivity uh, make us to use it as conductive, conduct, conductive layer for Cold transfer metal free perovskite solar cell. Uh, during this experiment, we also found a very interesting phenomenon. When we just uh, use this carbon material as a conducting layer, we didn't get a very high power conversion efficiency. But if we also mix this carbon material with the perovskite material, 
and then connect it with the carbon layer, we can double this power compression efficiency. This suggests that the functional groups on the carbon materials can have a very good connection with the perovskite material and lead to a high conductivity in the cell. As we as the research goes further, we found more interesting results. As we can see here, this is another sample obtained from the reaction between sodium and carbon dioxide. In this reaction, we increased our ramping rate and we found a very unique uh, structure here. We can see very small shadow pores on the carbon wall. Also, this material showed a much higher surface area over 1,000. The, the layer thickness is similar to the previous ones, about 2 nanometers. And the surface micropores have an average diameter of 1.8 nanometer, but the depths of the micropores are very small, only about 5 nanometers. This means that the pores actually it did not penetrate this carbon wall, but disperse shadowly on the graphene wall surface. This can uh, increase the surface area and provide more active sites for chemical reactions. How does these uh, how do these uh, surface micropores come? Later we found out this is due to the Etching effect of carbon dioxide. As we know, at a high temperature, carbon dioxide will react with carbon and form many holes. And in our uh, reaction condition for the alkaline and carbon dioxide, it's a very high temperature. Also, the reaction is also is exothermic. It can further rise the reaction temperature. And since the metals are fluidy, so we can get very shadow pores on the carbon layer surface. And these, uh, the introduction of these micro pores actually can um, further increase the accessible surface area of the material, introduce more active sites. These are all fascinating properties that are. Uh, promising for uh, energy storage applications like supercapacitors, factories, and adsorptions, etc. So to uh, confirm this, uh, to take advantage of this phenomenon of carbon dioxide, we later did more work on this part. We also used potassium to react with carbon dioxide to obtain these this micropores material. And for this one, the surface area is about 1031, and 70% of this surface area actually is contributed to the surface micropores via our calculation. The diameter of the micropores is similar to the previous one from sodium, and the micro core depth is about 0.6 nanometers, also very small. It seems like that the low melting point is very important for us to get this fascinating material. So we further uh, developed an alloy of potassium and sodium because the, by alloying the two metals, we can get an even lower melting point material. By using the alloy with 25% sodium and 75% potassium, we obtained, uh, we also obtained a surface micro porous graphene. It possesses a 
very high specific surface area, and 80% of them are contributed by micropores. And the uh, pore size are also slightly larger than the previous ones. All these materials also showed uh, the fascinating properties of the previous 3D carb carbon materials that they have many, uh, a lot of functional groups and high conductivity, but they even have a superior active sites. So we are quite, we are quite excited about the fascinating properties and applied them into various applications to see if they can be a uh, very valuable material for our society. We used the surface microporous graph in from sodium and carbon dioxide for super uh, for lithium ion battery. As we can see in this picture, a uh, high specific capacity close to 1000 milliamp hour per gram is attained at a charging rate of 0.2 C. And uh, to uh, around 300 milliamp hour per gram capacity can be retained at a super high charging rate, 150 C. This is a ultra fast charging rate, but the capacity can still uh, be maintained at such a level, this is very appreciable. This is due to the high electrical conductivity that allows the fast electron transfer and also the organized pore channels allow the electrode light to have uh, sufficient reservoirs. More importantly, the surface micropores allow the fast transfer of the ions in lithium ion battery. So finally, we can have such large reversible capacity. Also, the material is very stable in lithium ion battery. Uh, you see here after 10,000 cycling, we can still retain 91% capacity. Here we use the, the surface micropores graphing from the reaction between potassium and the carbon dioxide for supercapacitor application. As we can see in this picture A, this is a CV cycling of the supercapacitor with surface micropores graphing as the uh, symmetric electrodes. This uh, square, this uh, regular shape, as well as this symmetric triangle in the time current reaction suggests that this supercapacitor has a very good reversible charge adsorption desorption cycle. Also, due to the large accessible surface area and rich functional group of this material, we can obtain a very good read capacity as seen in this figure C. When we increase the current density, the capacity doesn't change much, especially after 2 amp per gram. Also, this material is very stable in the supercapacitor. After 5,000 cycles, um, almost the capacitance can be fully obtained. So this is an example of the uh, 3D surface microporous graphene for thin air batteries. And this thin air battery we designed is a flexible solid one. This is a very uh, promising application nowadays. And we use the surface microporous for as the air electrode of this cell. Requirements of the air electrode for zinc air battery is that it it should have a very large 
accessible surface area and the rich active sites for oxygen reduction and oxygen evolution. It also have to possess sufficient conductivity. When we use this material as the air electrode, we found very exciting results. So the re oxygen reduction potential for this material is relatively high compared to the commercial 20% potassium platinum carbon. Its oxygen evolution activity is quite outstanding, making the uh, voltage gap between oxygen oxidation and reduction very small. Resultantly, we can get an unprecedentedly small charge discharge voltage for this material. You can see here this uh, voltage gap is much smaller than the other materials. This can sufficiently reduce the uh, unwanted energy consumption during the discharge and charge of the battery. We also used the surface micropores graphene for capacitive deionization and the carbon adsorption. And here I want to give more detailed introduction about this part. If you are interested, you can um, refer to our work. Okay, in summary, we can use the you out reaction between alkali metal and carbon dioxide to obtain very fascinating 3D carbon materials with great potential for applications in various fields. In the future, we want to develop technologies to use renewable energy to regenerate alkali metals from the obtained carbonates to fulfill the cycle so that we can obtain these uh, fun wonderful materials by very low cost. Uh, also to mention that um, with this reaction, we can convert one third of the carbon dioxide into these functional carbon materials. This conversion rate is very high compared to the catalytic options. And also in the future, we will do further research to elucidate the reaction mechanism by some in situ strategies. Also, we will try to have precise control of the synthesis process to have a precise control of the material properties. We will also try to reduce the energy input for the reaction by taking advantage of the exosomic heat from the reaction itself. I'd like to thank my colleagues. Uh, they've contributed a lot to the above uh, research. And that's all of my uh, speech. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. San, for a very interesting talk. Uh, yes, I may start the questions. Um, so, um, so you use the, the metals and CO2 to, to produce a different kind of, of um, carbon nanomaterials. Yes. And you say that the, the alloy of, of, of the, the metal can, I think can, can lower the melting points and generate also a novel structure of, of materials. And, and that there is any criteria or, so, or, you know, strategy, I mean, to, to get different kind of, of uh, carbon nanostructures uh, besides the, the melting point that you said that it is important, but is there any other parameter that we have to consider? Uh, yes, the melting point is one important properties of the alkaline metal itself. Besides that, we can control the reaction conditions like I've mentioned, the reaction temperature, the reaction mm -hmm. time, and the ramping rate. Uh -huh. Yes, by varying these conditions, we can vary the properties of the carbon materials. I see, yes. I see, thank you. Yes, um, there may be and, more and, options. <laughs> yeah, 
and and you remove the metals from your final carbon products or, or it just uh you know include in your final products i mean the, the metal oh that's the interesting question uh question um actually uh as i've mentioned what we get is the metal carbonate and the carbon yes. so if we wash after washing we will remove the metal carbonates in the material but mm -hmm. what we found recently is that actually a very small amount of alkaline metal will be embedded in the carbon wall. And mm -hmm. these little amounts of alkaline metal actually can contribute greatly to the conductivity of this material, making nice. this material even more fascinating, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question from the floor. Um, is it hard to recover the metal after use? So uh, maybe the same question that I asked. Like, you, you uh, recover the metal. Yes, yeah. uh, and as I've mentioned in the future work, um, we know alkaline metal is very active. It's very hard to recycle it using the general uh, chemical reduction methods, but we can re also use the electrochemical ways to reduce the metal salt. And it may be, uh, it needs a very high voltage, maybe about three volts. But if we use the electric energy from renewable energy, mm -hmm. I think we can, yes, make a very low cost process for this whole cycle. I see, I see. Thank you. So I think the time is it's up. And, and also, thank you so much for your um, uh, excellent uh, presentation today. And, and hope uh, Dr. Woodbury will say hi to you, maybe, I don't know, during the oh. break. Okay, okay. Thank, okay. You. okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So back to the moderator, Dr. Supawadi. Um, before the break, you want to say something? Uh, um, during the break, uh, we would like you to feel the assessment form. Um, it will appear on the screen on the right hand side um, and it is the interactive you can uh, feel here on your screen by yourself it's just a few questions i think it's um take only one minute to to finish it we we would like to ask you to um, do it for us um, so that we can improve our work in the future You can click on each choice on the screen by yourself and send, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe we, we can get back in, I don't know, five minutes, something like that. Yeah, yeah, five okay. minutes. Take a bio break and, and let's get back in, in the uh, five minutes maybe. And uh, we will have uh, two more presentations in this morning session. ไฮเยนาภัยจากการเปลี่ยนแปลงของสภาพอากาศอันเนื่องมาจากก๊าซเรือนกระจกได้ส่งผลวิกฤตร้ายแรงไปทั่วโลกทั้งโรคระบาดไฟป่าคลื่นความร้อนไม่เว้นแม้แต่ประเทศไทยที่ต้องเผชิญกับมหันตภัยทางธรรมชาติที่มีความถี่และทวีความรุนแรงมากขึ้นเสมือนโลกส่งสัญญาณเตือนครั้งสุดท้ายให้ทุกประเทศหันมาตระหนักถึงการลดปริมาณก๊าซเรือนกระจกอย่างจริงจังกลุ่มวิจัยการเร่งปฏิกิริยาและการคำนวณระดับนาโนนาโนเทคสวทชได้มุ่งวิจัยเทคโนโลยีการดักจับและใช้ประโยชน์คาร์บอนซึ่งไม่เพียงช่วยลดการปลดปล่อยคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์สู่ชั้นบรรยากาศแต่ยังนำมาใช้เปลี่ยนเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ที่มีมูลค่าสูงทางเศรษฐกิจทีมวิจัยของเรานะคะทีมวิจัย n c a s มีเป้าหมายในการที่จะพัฒนาเทคโนโลยีเพื่อความยั่งยืนทางพลังงานและก็สิ่งแวดล้อมค่ะผ่านการใช้ตัวเร่งปริยาเคมีวัสดุนาโนแล้วก็กระบวนการทางเคมีใหม่ๆนะคะในการที่จะเปลี่ยน
ของเหลือใช้จากภาคการเกษตรและอุตสาหกรรมค่ะให้กลายเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์มากมูลค่าค่ะซึ่งจุดเด่นของทีมวิจัยของเรานะคะก็คือเราทํางานตั้งแต่ต้นน้ำไล่ไปจนถึงปลายน้ําเลยค่ะต้นน้ำเนี่ยเราก็ศึกษาองค์ความรู้เชิงลึกนะคะซึ่งจะเป็นรากฐานของนวัตกรรมในอนาคตส่วนปลายน้ำเนี่ยก็คือเราทํางานกับเอกชนเพื่อที่ว่าเราจะได้สเกลอัพเทคโนโลยีของเรานะคะจาก lab scale ไปสู่ pilot scale ค่ะเทคโนโลยีที่เราจะไฮไลท์ในวันนี้นะคะก็คือเทคโนโลยีการดักจับและใช้ประโยชน์ของคาร์บอนค่ะหรือคาร์บอนแคปเจอร์แอนด์ยูทิลิเซชันย่อสั้นๆว่า CCU นะคะ CCU เนี่ยเราเชื่ออย่างยิ่งว่าเป็นทางออกของการจัดการก๊าซรินกระจกของภาคอุตสาหกรรมไทยค่ะเพราะว่า CCU เนี่ยประกอบไปด้วย2อย่างนะคะอย่างแรกก็คือการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ก่อนที่จะถูกปล่อยไปในชั้นบรรยากาศและอย่างที่2ก็คือเอาก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ที่ดักจับมาได้เนี่ยค่ะนำมาเปลี่ยนเป็นสารเคมีหรือผลิตภัณฑ์ที่มูลค่าค่ะไอเดียของเทคโนโลยีนะคะก็คือเราสามารถนํากําไรที่ได้จากการขายผลิตภัณฑ์เหล่านี้ค่ะเป็นแรงจูงใจทางเศรษฐกิจให้เอกชนนําเทคโนโลยีนี้ไปใช้ได้จริงๆในอุตสาหกรรมค่ะงานวิจัยของทีม NCAS ของพวกเรานะคะก็ครอบคลุมกันตั้งแต่อาการพัฒนาวัสดุดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ค่ะโดยเฉพาะวัสดุกลุ่มคาร์บอนนะคะแล้วก็ Metal Organic Frameworks ค่ะซึ่งวัสดุเหล่านี้มีเป็นวัสดุที่มีรูฟุนสูงนะคะแล้วเราสามารถขยายกําลังการผลิตได้ง่ายเราสามารถปรับปรุงคุณสมบัติของวัสดุเหล่านี้ให้ดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ได้อย่างมีประสิทธิภาพซึ่งเราตั้งเป้าหมายไว้2ระ,ระยะนะคะระยะแรกก็คือการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์จากอุตสาหกรรมโดยตรงนะคะขั้นที่2ในระยะไกลกว่าก็คือการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์จากอากาศเลยทีเดียวค่ะแล้วก็นอกจากการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์นะคะเราก็ยังสนใจกระบวนการเปลี่ยนก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์เป็นสารเคมีด้วยค่ะซึ่งเราแบ่งเป้าเทคโนโลยีไว้เป็น3ระยะด้วยกันค่ะระยะแรกนะคะก็คือระยะใกล้กว่าเราจะใช้ความร้อนในการเปลี่ยนก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์นะคะเป็นอาสาตั้งต้นในอุตสาหกรรมปิโตรเคมีค่ะประกอบไปด้วยโปรดักต์สกลุ่มนะคะกลุ่มแรกก็คือกลุ่มซินแก๊สค่ะซึ่งเป็นสารผสมระหว่างคาร์บอนมอนอกไซด์แล้วก็ไฮโดรเจนค่ะผลิตได้จากการทําปฏิกิริยาระหว่างแก๊สคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์กับมีเทนกลุ่มที่2นะคะกลุ่มเมทานอลค่ะเมทานอลเนี่ยผลิตได้จากการทําปฏิกิริยาระหว่างก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์กับไฮโดรเจนค่ะส่วนเป้าหมายระยะกลางนะคะคือการใช้ไฟฟ้าในการเปลี่ยนก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์เป็นสารเคมีโดยเฉพาะจําพวกกลุ่มเอทิลีนแล้วก็เอทานอลค่ะซึ่งเป็นสารตั้งต้นของพลาสติกแล้วก็เคมีพันธุ์ของประเทศที่สําคัญมากๆนะคะเทคโนโลยีนี้มีข้อดีมากๆก็คือทํางานได้ที่อุณหภูมิต่ำความดันต่ำนะคะแล้วก็เชื่อมโยงกับพลังงานทางเลือกได้ในทันทีอย่างไร้รอยต่อค่ะเราเลยชื่อว่าเป็นเทคโนโลยีแห่งอนาคตนะคะแล้วขั้นตอนสุดท้ายระยะไกลนะคะก็คือเราจะใช้แสงอาทิตย์เนี่ยแหละค่ะในการเปลี่ยนแก๊ส CO2 เนี่ยค่ะให้กลายเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ทางเคมีค่ะซึ่งกระบวนการเนี่ยมีลักษณะใกล้เคียงกันเลยกับการสั่งเคราะห์แสงของพืชค่ะใช้เพียงแค่ก๊าซ CO2 นะคะ,ะน้ำแล้วก็แสงอาทิตย์ค่ะเราก็เลยเรียกเทคโนโลยีนี้นะคะว่าเทคโนโลยีการสังเคราะห์แสงประดิษฐ์ค่ะซึ่งจะมีประสิทธิภาพมากกว่าการสังเคราะห์แสงของพืชเป็น10เท่าเลยค่ะเราเชื่อว่าเป็นเทคโนโลยีสะอาดแห่งอนาคตอย่างแท้จริงค่ะเทคโนโลยีการดักจับแล้วก็ใช้ประโยชน์ของคาร์บอนหรือ CCU นะคะจะมีส่วนช่วยในการขับเคลื่อนโมเดลเศรษฐกิจ BCG อย่างแน่นอนค่ะเพราะว่านอกจากเราจะช่วยลดก๊าซเรือนกระจกแล้วนะคะเรายังสามารถนําก๊าซเรือนกระจกนั้นมาเปลี่ยนเป็นสารเคมีมากมูลค่าซึ่งจะตอบโจทย์ความต้องการของอุตสาหกรรมหนักอย่างแน่นอนถึงแม้ว่าเทคโนโลยีนี้ค่ะจะเป็นที่สนใจของอประชาคมโลกนะคะทั้งในแล้วก็ต่างประเทศแต่ว่าก็ยังมีวินนิ่งโซลูชันเลยค่ะเราเชื่ออย่างยิ่งนะคะว่าการพัฒนาเทคโนโลยี CCU ในประเทศด้วยคนไทยเป็นศิลปะของคนไทยเพื่อบริบทของอุตสาหกรรมไทยอะคะ่ะจะแก้ปัญหาการสร้างกระจกของประเทศไทยเพื่อให้ประเทศของเรานะคะถึงหมุดหมายการเป็นกลางทางคาร์บอนภายในปี2050อย่างแน่นอนค่ะท่านใดสนใจงานวิจัยของพวกเราชาว NCAS นะคะสามารถเยี่ยมชมได้นะคะจากที่เว็บไซต์ก่อนหรือว่าไปที่ Facebook Page เลยก็ได้นะคะแต่ถ้ายังไม่เพียงพอนะคะสามารถตบเท้าเข้ามาเยี่ยมชมพวกเราได้ที่ศูนย์นาโนเทคโนโลยีแห่งชาติได้เลยค่ะพวกเรามีงานวิจัยรักโลกเจ๋งๆมากมายนะคะที่ตอบโจทย์ BCG ของประเทศหรือว่าถ้าเอกชนท่านไหนนะคะอยากได้โซลูชันที
um, Professor Petra Pond earned her PhD from Imperial College London, UK, and she has worked in with um, PDT uh, Research and, and Technology Institute, and also Mahidol University, and Kais Korea uh, before she joined uh, Jolalongkorn University. She received numerous, numerous awards, uh, to name a few, uh, Laurel for Women in Science 2015 and uh, PTAT Scholar Award 2015 to 2016. And she's an expert on fuel cell and electrolyzer technology for syn gas, hydrogen generation, and CO2 conversion. The talk today is low carbon. Uh, High value chain chemicals, conversion of carbon dioxide to chemicals. So please welcome Dr. Patra Pon. Thank you. Let, let me share my slide. I hope you see my slide now. Um, yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Kajon Sak, for introduction. And also, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, conference. It's my great pleasure to be here and to learn from many other great speakers today also. So let me begin the talk with a uh, Thailand long-term strategy toward net zero emission. Um, Thailand is among many countries have joined the conference of party COP26 last year, and we have announced our NDC to reduce the greenhouse gas by 40% in 2030 and to become carbon neutral and achieve net zero emission in 2050 and 65 respectively. After that, many uh, policies have followed. For example, in 2035, to increase the share of the electric vehicle in the new vehicle in the market up to 69%. In 2037, to achieve of the CO2 removal of up to 120 uh, metric ton of CO2 equivalent um, by forestation. And 2050 to increase the share of electric, re uh, electric uh, renewable energy up to 50% um, for the new power generation capacity. And one recent important uh, policy for Ministry of Energy is core 4D and 1E. One is stand for electrification and 4D stand for digitalization, decarbonization, decentralization, and deregulation. So carbon capture, utilization, and storage is included in the decarbonization plan toward the carbon neutrality in Thailand. Carbon neutrality is a balance between source and carbon source and carbon sinks. So moving toward carbon neutrality, we must reduce the carbon source and include the carbon sinks. So the carbon source can be various from power sector, transportation, and industry. So this emitted CO2 can be captured either at the point sources, such as from the factory uh, power plant, or it can be captured directly from the air. This, uh, we call it direct air capture. It's very important technology in near future because none of the CO2 capture technology can earn 100% capture. So at least unavoidable, some CO2 will be emitted in, into the air directly. And also some of the sector we have is really hard to be abated. For example, the aviation sector. So again, unavoidable, some CO2 will be released into the atmosphere and we need the DAC technology to bring down the CO2 concentration. The forestation is very important method for Thailand to capture and store CO2 at the same time. The capture CO2 then can be stored permanently by sequestration or stored non-permanently in value products by utilization. And this is uh, to create the CO2 cycle and the utilization method can be various um, as mentioned, like thermochemicals, electrochemical photocatalytics and biological conversion. So when we talk about the carbon capture utilization and storage or CCUS, we have two terms divided. The first one is the carbon capture and storage or CCS. The CCS is the process of capturing CO2 and then injecting it underground and store it there permanently. And this could be in the shell that are depleted or 
oil or natural gas or geological cavity to prevent the release of large amount of CO2 back into the atmosphere. Actually, CCS is really good in terms of environmental aspect, but that we treat CO2 as well. So this process right now does not generate any revenue or plus the CCU or carbon capture and utilization is to utilize the capture CO2 either in the direct approach or indirect approach. For the direct approach, for example, we can utilize it in the enhanced oil recovery or EOR, or we can use it in the soft drink uh, beverage industry, like to make a soft drink soda. We can use it as a solvent in food industry and so on. Um, for the indirect approach, this includes the conversion of CO2 into higher value products. Um, for example, fuel like methane or dimethyl ether, or conversion it into chemicals like um, methanols or dimethyl carbonates. So CCU is the way to make a CO2 cycle and can be good for environment. Um, it can have opportunity to make profits or investment return at which we CO2 at resource. So now let's have a look at the opportunity factor for CCUS in Southeast Asia country. As you can see in this table, Thailand have many opportunity in many um, factor, including the recognition of the CCUS in the long-term strategies. We have LTS already. We also have the targeted policies to support the CCUS investment. Recently, BOI have uh, announced the incentive for the technology, but we still don't have any active pilot demonstration facility, and we don't have yet for the plan for commercialization of the CCUS facility. So these are the issues that needed to be accelerated and support in this region. And then when we have a look at the global level, in global level, the number of the CCUS facility, which is counted at the world large scale, are still low in number. Even though from the 2021, uh, when the COP21 took place, after that, the number are increasing. But as you can see in the graph here, that the data up to 2020, we have only one, uh, 21 operating facility um, at the world large scale. And all of them are CCS plus EOR. And most of them came from the natural gas processing. So these data point out that uh, the CCU technology, the CCUS, especially CCU technology is still not well mature, uh, even in the global level. So now come to the key facts and key questions. The, on your left are the key facts and on your right are the key questions. The key fact, we know that the net zero emission is unavoidable and it will affect us environmentally, socially, and sooner, sooner economically. And we know that mitigation alone is not enough and the CCUS technology must be adopted. We know that CCS does not generate any revenue or profit. And we know that CCU is not easy. So CO2 conversion is hard and normally expensive in terms of material costs, energy costs. And, but if we, have, uh, if we start to consider environmental costs, the scenario might be different. So these are all the key facts. And let's have a look at the key questions. Since the CCUS technology, especially CCU technology are not well mature, even in the global level, should the industry in Thailand wait for the CCS technology shopping or licensing? If the answer is yes. So the following questions are how long do they have to wait and how much for the investment? On the other hand, should the industry start their own technology development? So the same questions, how long for the technology development and also how much for the investment. The two more Im important questions are what to produce from CO2 and how to produce and will and whether these selected uh, products and method will make the investment return. This is the key important question. And the last question is about how to convey the message to society. There should be the regulation to facilitate the CCUS technology development from government. There should be an incentive and there should be the infrastructure investment for this technology. So in this study, we uh, focus on methanol as high value chemicals in Thailand. So as you can see in the 
picture here is the value chain of CO2, methanol, and DMC. Uh, methanol is a precursor for many chemical synthesis, which are used by many industries. For example, engineering plastic, coating, painting, packing, fiber industry, construction, or even pharmaceutical industry. Methanol itself can be used as fuel as well, and also is a precursor for biodiesel production. And it is also used for dimethyl carbonate or DMC synthesis. The DMC volume of demand will be increased significantly in near future since the DMC is the uh, composition in the electric vehicle electrolyte. And right now the DMC is uh, used extensively in the plastic uh, industry. So one possible answer to the question was to produce on CO2 is to produce the product with high value and high value chain. Ideally, we need the products with both high value and high volume of demand or high value chain. But in reality, a great deal of the research have done on developing supply chain optimization methodology for high value, but high value, but low volume products or high volume but low value product industry. So, but anyway, how um, a high value chain product will guarantee us the volume of demand and also a larger benefit of CO2 reduction in the country. So let's have a look at the figure here. Methanol demand in Thailand have grown about four to five percent each year. And for the global level, it's expected that the, the the market of methanol will be increased up to 91.5 billion US dollar in 2026. And the global annual production of methanol is around 110 million ton per year. And currently, world methanol almost derived from the fossil source, such as natural gas. So because it comes from natural gas, so approximately 1.5 tons of CO2 is emitted per one ton of methanol production. So if it come to our interest to synthesis methanol directly from CO2 to create the CO2 cycle into the high, into the high value chain chemicals in Thailand. But as we know that the conversion of CO2 into any product is not easy because the stability of the CO2, and as we know that thermal chemical conversion is the nearest term for the commercialization, but still suffer from an economical return. Um, we have summarized four main factors for the barriers. The first issue is about the cost of the CO2 capture, separation, purification, and including transportation. So this is required of the better separation method or a new processing scheme for CO2, uh, for using CO2 gas mixture without any pre-separation. The second issue is about the energy requirement in the CO2 thermochemical conversion. It is required for for the reductions of energy intensity in the process. And the third issue is about hydrogen, because thermal chemical conversion needs hydrogen, and the hydrogen should be from the process that does not co-produce CO2 to bring down the CO2 level of the process and open opportunity for the process to become net negative CO2 emission. And the last issue, which the issue that we as a researcher cannot do thing much about, um, market side limitation and the lack of investment incentive for the CO2 based chemicals. This is about the policy making and also encouraging the industrialized society to utilize more of the low CO2 based products. So now uh, we are moving into the conversion of CO2 to methanol. The conventional method for the CO2 conversion to methanol rely on Hydro, a CO2 hydrogenation reaction with its exothermic and also can be catalyzed around 20 to 300, uh, 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. Um, if you have a look on this graph your, on your left top, it is equilibrium conversion of the CO2 with temperature and each line represents orbiting pressure. And as you can see here that due to the thermodynamic constraint as increasing temperature, the equilibrium conversion decreased. So, it leads to low methanol yield. And in order to gain higher methanol yield and CO2 conversion, we need a really high pressure. So this process becomes energy intensive process. So there is a 
proposed of the new process called alcohol assisted method or solvent assisted method. By adding a proper solvent or alcohol, the lead determining step has been shifted from the uh, hydrogenation of the farming species, this is active farming species, to esterification of the active farming species. And this open opportunity to reduce the operating temperature. And also, as you can see here that the operating window has shifted to the, in the blue rectangle here. So it's open opportunity to increase the CO2 conversion, methanol use, and reduce energy consumption of the process. So in this study, we various type of alcohol added into the system. The system is a pressurized system with CO2 and hydrogen at 50 bar and 150 degrees Celsius. And we use conventional catalyst copper zinc oxide, which is prepared by co precipitation. So as, we, as you can see here that when we add the various type of alcohol, the CO2 conversion and methanol yield have improved significantly when compared to the uh, conventional CO2 hydrogenation. However, we expect that this alcohol add will be act as the catalytic solvent. But in reality, some side reaction had occurred simultaneously. Alcohol dehydrogenation occur and um, for example, if we add ethanol into the system, um, the ethanol will undergo uh, alcohol dehydrogenation and ethyl acetate and hydrogen are formed. Actually, formation of hydrogen is good to the system, but ethyl acetate is actually, even though it itself has value and high demand, but ethyl acetate is formed acetyltope mixture with methanol and it complicates the product purification of the overall process. So in here, when we compare the different alcohol and different molecule of the alcohol from the small molecule to the larger molecule, we found that the small molecule alcohol provide a higher methanol yield. And then when, when we compare the same molecule, the same carbon number, but different structure, we found that the branched alcohol, the branched structure alcohol give the lower methanol yield compared to the space chain or normal alcohol. And uh, Normal alcohol, the state chain alcohol doesn't form the product that form the acetyltope mixture with methanol, so it's less complicated for the product separation. This is an example of the many acetyltope mixture formation after we add ethanol as a catalytic solvent in the system. There are many couples of the acetyltope formation here and complicate the product purification. So this emphasizes that the uh, proper solvent or proper alcohol are very important to this new process and the subsequent byproduct from the alcohol or solvent can complicate the product purification and the economic and the performance of the process. So next, trying to avoid the side reaction of alcohol dehydrogenation, we investigate the operating condition. We're trying to reduce the orbiting temperature and pressure in the same system, having ethanol as a catalytic solvent and also copper zinc oxide as a common co uh, conventional catalyst. In here, when we try to reduce the temperature from 150 degrees Celsius to 130 at the same orbiting pressure at 50 bar, and we can see here that methanol selectivity increased significantly from 87% to 98% because less side reaction occur and less dehydrogenation reaction of ethanol occur. But instead, it is a trade off on the methanol yield because methanol yield also decrease. And then when we try to reduce the pressure from 50 to 35 bar at the same opposing temperature, both methanol yield and selectivity decrease at the same time. So from this reaction, it is likely that orbiting temperature can be the way to control and avoid the side reaction and ease the product purification of this process. But still, the methanol yield need to be optimized to be methanol yield at the acceptable level. And next, we also try to avoid the byproducts from the side reaction, but we want to keep the same orbiting temperature and pressure. So we try this way 
by adding the molecular sleep into the system. Molecular sleep is aimed to absorb the byproducts. So we added uh, 3A and 5A molecular sleep by mixing with the copper zinc oxide. So from here, the results show that all the molecular sleep enhance the methanol yields and methanol selectivity. And also the higher methanol yields go to 3A molecular sleep plus the copper zinc oxide. The 3A molecular sleep is aimed for absorb water in the system, which is the byproduct from the system. And 5A molecular sleep uh, would prove to be able to separate methanol from ethyl acetate. Still, the volume of the methanol absorption needs to be optimized. But actually, this, um, this uh, method is not so quite charming because if we use the molecular sleep into the system, we also need to think about the regeneration unit of the, the molecular sleep after it's used for each batch of the reaction. So next, it is the techno-economic analysis of the process. We compare the performance and economics of the process. The figure A is the, the conventional methanol synthesis from CO2 hydrogenation process. And the figure B is alcohol assisted process. And you can see here that from the techno economic analysis, um, it revealed that the new process can have opportunity to increase the CO2 conversion per pipe in the reactor and also reduce the hydrogen consumption about 25%. So which is good, we can feed less hydrogen to the process. And in terms of energy consumption, the energy consumption decreased significantly in the feed and in the reactor section. But instead, it increased significantly in the product purification section here. So the obtained result here indicate that the type of the catalytic solvent or alcohol used in the process and the product purification are two main important factors here. And to the approach for enhancements of the CO uh, process profitability should be relied on the wise design of these uh, product purification process and also the type of the select proper type of solvent, catalytic solvent used in the process. Next, let's move on a little bit on the carbon pricing. Actually, currently carbon price is at the present time, it, it, it is about 87 euro per ton of carbon dioxide. And it is expected that it will, be, it will be increasing up to 90 euro per ton by the end of this year. Um, for, the, for, the carbon, uh, for the capture cost, actually it ranged widely from 30, 30, 35 to 300 euro per ton carbon dioxide, um, depending on technology. But this is expected to be decreased Averagely down below 50 euro per ton of carbon dioxide. So it's important message here that we see the revenue gap. And this revenue gap will be even more increased if this CO2 recapture will be converted into higher value products. And you can see the price here from CO2 to methanol and from methanol further conversion to dimethyl carbonate. So we can keep create the value added to the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide in here. So I would like to take some time now to uh, interview for the uh, collaboration of CCUS consortium. As we know that um, we, we are all trying to, our effort to convert CO2 as the uh, work I have presented earlier. And we know that the moving toward the carbon neutrality must, uh, CCUS must be adopted. And the CCUS technology might be um, CCUS technology might be accelerated, and only one university or only one research center uh, is not sufficiently work alone. So we need many group of collaboration. This is one of the collaboration have been established recently. We call this CCUS Technology Development Consortium. It's a work a work among university government sector and our uh, Thailand leading company, major company in Thailand. So we have formed this six years consortium to accelerate the technology development of, um, in this country. Actually, in the technology development or moving toward the 
carbon neutrality by CCUS technology, knowledge sharing platform is very important. We also meet up with many leading group in CO2 utilization in Thailand and also outside Thailand. And recently we also meet up with the NCAS, the nano catalysis and molecular simulation research group of Dr. Kajon Sak. And I hope that this uh, knowledge sharing platform will be keep up and, and, and we still have um, work together to push up the CCS technology forward. And let's have a look at the ultimate goal of the CCS consortium. Um, we have the goal to develop the technology of the CCUS and also drive from the research to the real application. And our four main objectives are, first one is to build a strong cooperative network among the parties and also to promote the public concerns in terms of CO2 emission to the climate prop change problems and also to emphasize the importance of the CCUS technology in solving these problems. And also to accelerate the CCUS technology development and also drive from the research to the real application. So this is our uh, consortium objective. After we form the consortium, um, there are two boards established. The consortium advisory board will work with the commi uh, working committee. So the advisory board will provide the direction of the consortiums and the working committee will manage, we will prioritize the, the uh, consortium work within the objective and stay on time and on budget. So these are all the examples of uh, collaborative work of the CCUS um, technology development in Thailand. Um, at the end, I would like to say that there are many important factors toward the carbon neutrality, as we know that legislation should be their policy instrument for uh, incentive and support, funding mechanisms, infrastructure investment, knowledge sharing among people are very important, and also of course the research and technology development, and also cooperative, collaborative working and feedback between the group of working people to the regulatory body, also very important to create the platform of the CCUS technology development um, um, in Thailand. And at the end, I would like to say that actually low carbon-based product with high value chain will be a new environmentally friendly product and create the economic value for waste and also stimulating the um, a circular economy. So this is important issue that people today should pay attention. Actually good environment is the important capital and we must try to save our environment capital as much as possible to pass it on to the next generation. So this is end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's it's very informative and constructive um, talks. I think uh, I think everyone can can learn a lot from from this talk. And I I mean start with um, one questions about the the uh, what kind of product like like um, you raised the question in the, in the, the the beginning of the, the presentation. So, in your opinion, so um, the for Thailand, so methanol and 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 DMC can be, you know, a, a good product for CCU technology at the moment, or do we have any other choices to to share with us? So I think the the product choice can be various, but but important to consider is uh, whether that product store much of CO2 for a long time. Actually, uh, uh, before the presentation about the carbon products also interesting because it stores CO2 for a long time in terms of the solid products. But we also need to care about the volume of demand or the value chain. The, the product with high value chain will guarantee us that we have a volume of the CO2 reduction in country. If we shoot the product that utilize a lot in the country, then we can reduce a lot of CO2 as well. So in my opinion, it's a combination between the stalling, the length of the stalling or the CO2 loop, how large of your loop you create, and also how big of the loop you have created as well. So it's very interesting to, to shoot what the product should be the focus. Yeah. I see, thank you. 
And then one more question. Um, besides the alcohol, so I'm not sure if if others uh, you call catalytic solvent, right? If there is um, other good alternates, alternatives um, solvent for, for this system. I, I, I suppose it should be some other suitable solvent as well. So we, we must try different solvents because right now we, we break through that we can overcome the, the CO2 conversion above, above the equilibrium uh, conversion with the CO2 hydrogenation. So this open opportunity for this process to become um, economically feasible. But after that, we have to see a whole process that you also have to separate and, and have a good quality or purity of the product as well. So I, I suppose that shows the proper catalytic solvent will be the key for this, this, um, this the process uh, disability. Yeah. And there should be other the solvent to try as well, I think. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, actually, to, to be kindly inform you, I, I um, report to my boss, uh, Dr. Wani. I think she's here also about our meeting last time, and she's very happy. She's very happy if if um, we can initiate some some more solid collaborations, and also if we can join some CCU activity together in in the future. That would be really nice. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, thank you so much, um, Professor Petra Pon, and. Now we are moving to the next uh, talk. Dr. Posana, I think she is um, ready. So uh, Dr. Posana, he runs it, is a senior researcher from Nanotech, uh, Thailand. Uh, she received her PhD in chemical engineering from Texas A&M University, USA in 2010. So she has been working in electrocatalysis for CO2 reduction reaction for more than 10 years, I think. And she used um, DFT calculation to get insight into the reaction mechanisms and catalyst designs for uh, selective reduction of CO2 to uh, design products. So from her dedication to nanomaterial and catalysis field, she was awarded the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Award in 2017. And today she will give um, a presentation on theoretical insights into CO2 electro reduction towards ethylene and ethanol. So now the floor is your prof, uh, Dr. Pusana, please. Uh, can you see the slide? Yes, clear. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> Thank you very okay. much, Dr. Kajonsa. Um, so I'm happy to uh, to be here today and I, I would like to share the work that we have done at NCAST and but I'm gonna switch the gear of the talk to into the theoretical um, study that we use the atomistic uh, simulation to uh, study the the fundamental uh, point of view to uh, for the carbon dioxide electro reduction uh, conversion to uh, focus at the ethylene and ethanol product. So this process is a part of the CO2 utilization, which is I think we've been uh, focused in the whole session and that the ultimate goal is that we would like to push the, uh, the technology of this CO2 utilization that we involved in uh, important in to create a neutral carbon dioxide cycle in, in the environment. So the, the electrochemical reaction is the is an approach that is very attractive because uh, the reaction itself it can uh, take place at the room temperature and low pressure and the the process itself can be uh, can be a discontinuous process. Uh, so that means it is possible that we can use the uh, the renewable, sustainable, and clean energy resources like uh, solar cells energy to um, to supply the energy to this reaction. However, the great challenges that we still need in this process is definitely coming from to find the right catalyst to uh, 
drive the reaction to reach the reactivity and selectivity of our target product um, to the maximum that we can um, uh, to, can achieve and then to optimize a lot of process parameters to, to reach that goal as well. So in this talk, I'm going to uh, present you to the what we achieve in the terms of the theoretical study that we can understand how the conversion of the carbon dioxide, particularly we focus at the ethylene and ethanol product on the copper 100 catalyst and copper zinc 111 catalyst. So the the fundamental uh, that we receive uh, from the the this uh, study, we hope that it will give some guideline that we can uh, decide the catalyst and tune the product selectivity uh, toward ethylene or ethanol. So at this day. Um, so, so copper is the pure metal catalyst that is best known to um, to it is the pure metal that 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 catalyze the carbon dioxide electroreduction reduction uh, the best so far and we there are so many studies have shown that uh, the reaction reactivity and selectivity strongly depend on uh, the the copper facets. So, like for example, the copper 111 facet the high, uh, give the highest selectivity towards C1 product, which are methane, carbon monoxide, and formate. For the copper 110, still uh, the highest selectivity is still also toward the C1 product, which are mostly for methane, formate, and a little bit of uh, C2, which is ethylene. But the copper 100 is very interesting because this uh, catalyst can give the highest selectivity to the C2 product uh, to eat ethylene and ethanol at even lower over potential. And it can it suppress the formation of C1 light format and carbon monoxide. So this I show you the uh, experimental results from uh, Professor Yeo's group, who uh, also be a, a speaker in the afternoon session. And so in this work, we uh, he did on the copper 100 surface. So you can see uh, some observation we can see in the experimental result here is that the ethylene product started to uh, pre be produced when the carbon monoxide approaching a plateau. So this is give us a gui uh, guidance that the CO is a key intermediate toward the ethylene production. And uh, the peak of the production of the ethylene and ethanol uh, occur at uh, approximately the same uh, electro potential. This is showing us that there are some connections in the pathway between ethylene and ethanol. And uh, from this plateau that is start to produce uh, ethylene, we uh, have we uh, suspect that the possible uh, the CC bond formation uh, occur at the cup, uh, coupling of the CO molecule. So first, we uh, use the theory, uh, molecular simulation to understand that how the the capability of each copper facets are different in terms of the carbon dioxide uh, built up on the surface. As we can see that the the ethylene can start to produce when the CO production is reached the plateau. So we calculate the binding strength and as a function of the carbon monoxide. Uh, surface coverage. So we can see that the 111, which is the red line here, is absolutely is the least favorable to build CO on the surface because uh, once the coverage increases, the 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 CO started to by uh, weaken on on uh, significantly weaken on on the 111 surface. Uh, on the other hand, for the 100, the black line and the 110, they show uh, 
a higher uh, ability to build up the CO on the on the surface. And then we looking at the key in a elementary step where uh, the CC uh, the C2 uh, backbone species should be formed, which uh, could be the COCO dimerization reaction. And we calculate the energy barrier that we use as a function of the CO surface coverage too. And we and the results show that the copper 100 gives the lowest energy barriers. So this means that 100 not only be able to build up this uh, uh, contain high uh, coverage of the CO on the surface. It also uh, facilitate the coupling of the CO-CO dimerization, which would give the C2 uh, backbone species that are at the high, uh, at the lower energy barriers. So the kinetic is uh, much less prohibited. So, uh, but the CC coupling, uh, can also uh, have the other uh, elementary step that could be possible as well. Like for example, once the CO can uh, be uh, further reduced uh, by the, uh, to become the, you know, the protonation can happen at the oxygen or carbon atoms and that would produce COH or CHO. So this can also be the, possible uh, reaction step that are uh, important to form the CC bond. Uh, and so then we, we will investigate that furthermore in the CC coupling reaction. And we, in this work, we also want to uh, uh, understand the comprehensive of this uh, mechanism until we reach the product of ethylene and ethanol and to identify that what step or what intermediate that control the, the pathway toward ethanol and ethylene that they separate from each other. So the important in terms of the modeling is the SOM model in, in the system, because uh, especially when we're talking about and uh, not just the C1 product, uh, when we go into the toward the C2 or C3 or higher carbon uh, molecule, then the molecule will uh, contain more oxygen atoms, more hydrogen atoms, and then so a molecule would play an important role in the intermediate stabilization or destabilization by the forming the hydrogen bond with the uh, uh, water uh, network in, in the solvent. So we decided to include um, the solvent molecule explicitly in the model and uh, because we have seen in uh, that the results are quite sensitive in, in the, uh, in the for the solvent that uh, or model selection um, in the theoretical work. And this is show you some example. This is the product of the COCO dimerization. That's OCCO species. So on the left-hand side, if we do the, uh, the simulation in the vacuum system, then this is the most con uh, stable configuration. But on the right side, this is uh, where we include the explicit uh, so when molecule in, in, the, in our model, this is the most stable uh, configuration and we cannot even identify this uh, configuration in the vacuum system. So in the work, we have included the three water layer molecule, but the, the most important water layer is the one in the first one, which is in contact with the intermediate, the s of intermediates and also the catalyst surface. However, the second and third model is still needed because uh, the first, because water form the hydrogen network and it's not just the intra layer, they also form with the interlayer. And this is, uh, so these two and three uh, third layers need to be uh, included too so that water could uh, um, represent as the bulk water to, uh, in the hydrogen network system and in the water. So first look at this uh, very first step <clears throat> of the reaction is that uh, once the carbon dioxide is reduced to produce carbon monoxide on the surface, 
So here's once the carbon monoxide is produced. So the next step would be carbon monoxide can be reduced to be COH or CHO. And uh, both of them are, uh, uh, energetic uphill and for the next one so but the, it's easier to form coh than the cho so once we have that we can furthermore when we have uh, accumulate more carbon monoxide on the catalyst surface we produce more carbon monoxide then the coupling reaction start uh, can can happen between two neighboring uh, carbon monoxide molecules uh, it can so can have the cup COCO dimerization or the coupling between COCOH or COCHO. So this is uh, we found that these three coupling reaction are energetic downhill, so they are uh, possible in terms of the thermodynamics. However, in the for the energy barriers uh, that it needs to be overcome, uh, the CO dimerization is the, the least, so it's the easiest one. And the COCOH is not very difficult too, but a 0 0.68. So we, and this result suggests us that at the higher negative uh, potential and the more reductive potential, so once the CO uh, and protonation to be COH can happen, then the protein, uh, the coupling of the step COCOH can also happen at the higher negative potential as well. So, so after we produce the dimerization, the COCO dimerization occurred. So the protonation of this uh, product can happen to uh, protonate at carbon or oxygen atoms. So, so and these two uh, reactions can uh, happen at with the uh, exothermic uh, reaction and and the energy is very comparable. So we keep these two intermediate to to toward the until we reach the final products. So at each step, we have calculated um, all possible uh, product uh, intermediate at each elementary step, and but we keep only those that have show. Uh, uh, and its potential energy in, in a very uh, close range where we still uh, have account for the local minimum that we probably find and the dynamic of the water structure that could also change uh, some of the energy that we have calculated. So in those margins, so we still keep some of uh, all those intermediates uh, that in each elementary step that are possible. So. So in this, so I showed that the early step of uh, of the reduction in the black line here, these are the common step uh, toward both uh, ethanol and ethylene product. So once we go down here, so the green line here, it will be the intermediate that will definitely lead us to only ethylene product. And the red line here are the key intermediates and the path that will lead to only ethanol product. But the purple here, these are the intermediates and the path that uh, have the connection that can lead uh, to uh, both ethylene and ethanol product. So if we looking at that, how the pathway uh, bifurcate, so the ethanol production, it will start at the uh, acetyl uh, intermediate, uh, this one, and then, then acetyl will be reduced to form uh, acetaldehyde. So, and this, this will lead to only ethanol product. So in the experiment, it's also confirmed that if we uh, take acetaldehyde to reduce acetaldehyde, then the only product we will see is uh, is will be ethanol, but we will not find the uh, ethylene product. So, and for the green path, which will lead to only ethylene product, this is, these are the paths that this intermediate will include that the, the step that strip out the oxygen uh, atoms will have to happen at the early step. 
um, and then this will lead to the only ethylene product. For the purple class, these are the intermediates that will link us to both product, and this is uh, poses the challenges to uh, to the selectivity of ethylene or ethanol. We want one of them to be uh, the highest, and um, so we always will get these two products together. So the the this is a key one, the ethylene oxide. Um, and the ethylene oxide, it can be uh, protonated to form CH2, uh, CH2OH. And this can go to either to be final ethanol or um, the CO bond breaking happen and, and can form ethylene and OH on the surface. So the, 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 we have noticed that uh, when we, the stripping of the oxygen atom will not, uh, uh, by not removing as the water molecule will be difficult at the early stage where the intermediates are not uh, fully hydrogenated are not really much hydrogenated. So the CO bond breaking of these intermediate at the early step is difficult. So the process to remove oxygen will occur only as uh, the protonation and form water molecule. But once the intermediate getting at to more fully hydrogenated, this uh, CO bond breaking can happen quite easily and the kinetic is not hindered and which is uh, can be as easy as uh, the CO dimerization. So in order to tune the ethylene or an ethanol selectivity, so the best way to, for to get the ethylene is to reach the green uh, pathway here and the red uh, pathway here is for the ethanol and for the, the, the challenging um, that uh, we'll probably have to go through the purple pathway, but it's to have the catalyst that be able to block the, um, the OC bond dissociation, which happened at very late step. And next, I would like to uh, talk about another strategy that uh, a lot have been done and using by metallic uh, catalyst and um, the concept behind that, like uh, in this case, I'm gonna talk about copper zinc catalyst. So zinc is uh, selected because it is it has been shown to have the high selectivity to uh, CO2 reduce to be carbon monoxide. So the role of the thing that initially expected is to have the role to only produce carbon monoxide. And then the rest of the uh, reduction of carbon monoxide will happen at the copper catalyst. And so in this, in this uh, picture, um, I show you the, the free energy of the step of the COCO dimerization. And this is we still keep the use uh, the model facet model of one on one, which uh, we seen earlier that it's not uh, the geometry of the surface that uh, would promote the COCO dimerization. And and of course we have seen uh, a very high uh, activation barrier that it's need to be overcome. But for the copper thing where we uh, uh, do the alloy mixing and, and then have the 25% of the zinc and 75% of copper, uh, dramatically reduce of the uh, activation energy of the CO-CO dimerization um, more than half on the copper zinc. So this is uh, definitely show us that uh, the role of the zinc is beyond to produce the carbon monoxide it changed the electronic structure of the copper. It uh, that makes the cop uh, copper even better facilitate this uh, CO dimerization. Even we maintain the unfavor uh, geometry structure of the 111 facet. And then we're looking at all the uh, the pathway or the intermediate that finally reach the ethylene and ethanol product here. So this is. Um, so we found that it's not uh, the ethanol product remain the same, both the copper and copper zinc, but the 
turns out that the mechanism has changed for the ethylene pathway uh, for the uh, between copper zinc and pure copper. So that means that this uh, alloy mixing is also uh, changed the, uh, the favorability mechanism toward the product as well. Another factor is when you mix uh, with, uh, in this case also, this is we show all the uh, free energy absorption of all those intermediates in the pathway. So the purple, you can see these are the copper zinc and, um, and the orange are for the copper. And, and some intermediates are more favorable on the copper zinc, but some uh, to both surface show uh, quite comparable uh, absorption, uh, free energy absorption like um, OCCOO, which is the key, and uh, that's from the CO dimerization. These are more stable on the copper zinc, and also uh, the ethylene oxide that will, will also be the key intermediate in the pathway, but also much more uh, stabilized on the copper zinc. And, and also another key point is that the these Copper zinc provides such a variety of the ferro side because you can see that all different side they show a, a similar uh, uh, stability of the intermediates. While on the copper side, you have much less the the the, re, the active size for these intermediates, and one side would be much much more stable, and the rest are much less. So this is like in a on a copper it will be likely that these intermediate probably gonna go just to one or two sides on the copper but much more uh, variety of the size on the when you mix a uh, copper and zinc so to to conclude my uh, talk today is that i presented uh, in the in the theory theoretical insights that um with the catalyst, the, the ability of the catalyst to build the CO, which is the uh, key intermediate to, to lead to the C2 product is very important. Uh, and um, we have identified a key intermediate that will lead the pathway to ethanol and ethylene product and uh, emphasize the importance of the catalyst that need to um, manage the CO bond dissociation and as uh, in order to increase the selectivity uh, toward ethanol and um, and the effect of the zinc uh, copper zinc bimetallic so zinc is just uh, work beyond the produce uh, CO2 uh, CO uh, production but also lower the energy barrier of the other key step of CO dimerization, and it can even alter the, the, the mechanism itself, and it's offer a much more variety. So the biometallic uh, is uh, it's a good strategy to in in to show that. And I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues and collaborators, and a lot of uh, calculation in this work has been done by Ms. Jilapat, uh, also a member in NCAS and uh, Atit, and he's a, a PhD student and uh, supervised by Professor uh, Suvit uh, from Surana University. And uh, our colleagues are in the experimental part, um, Dr. Saranya, Dr. Pongkan, Dr. Bunyapat, Dr. Kajonsa, and, and, uh, and Professor Yeo from National University of Singapore, and all the funding from uh, NASDA, Nanotech, EMUB, computational resource from Thai SC. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Pusina, for your uh, um, comprehensive uh, presentations on the, the uh, CO2 reduction. Um, we have uh, questions. Uh, in in reality, apart apart from copper facet, is there any other approaches we could control each pathway towards so uh, ethylene or ethanol? selectivity to occur? Uh, to control each pathway, <laughs> that's that's a very big challenge. Yes, we even we can, uh, we identify, but I think how we can decide the catalyst 
toward each path, toward the key intermediate. That's that's a big challenge. So uh, so so there's a lot of strategy. So now we can uh, just focus on the peel metal. We going or we can do in terms of the uh, structures, uh, uh, geometry in a lot. Um, if we're talking about the geometries, then we, we go to other, uh, I think, I'm not sure, we can go to other strategy to control selectivity. And, but also uh, one key of, in terms of uh, uh, geometry sensitive, so in terms of this copper 100, it's been known to, to its square geometry that, that make the benefit it's better than the 111 or 110 or other facets because this is really uh help it to this is actually the underlying that why the 100 can build up uh more uh, co and also really promote uh, co dimerization on uh so there's a other strategy i have seen like adding atom uh, like Dubai metallic, but it control in uh, to form. It's like in a sort of the uh, square geometry. Uh, keep that like something like that. Okay, thank you. And maybe uh, the last questions uh, from Kun Pacharin. Thank you very much. It is very interesting results and uh, what what is the the method or software you you use for this study for for this DFT study. Uh, we we use swaps. Uh, mostly we use swaps, and um, that's the main software. <laughs> and okay. for the DFT calculations, and that's um, yes, that's that's uh, that's that's yeah. The the most powerful tools for for this kind of reaction. Uh, or, or probably the, another one. Some um, mostly are for the. Uh, for the result analysis, um, uh, but not not in you know commercial. The only one commercial that we use is uh, is Wabs and and the other we um, analyze and you know we can uh, not 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 things special. We can, you can use yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Pusna, for for your uh, excellent talk. Okay, so uh, I think we are going to the, the almost the end of the morning session. So I think uh, maybe I can have uh, spend a very short time to wrap up a bit on, on what we have learned from our morning session. So uh, Professor Zhang shared with us the, the recent focus on the IM catalyst development for for production of syn gas, you know, from CO2 and methane. So the confinement strategy may support interface or defect confinements are uh, uh, effective way to have the, the synergy between the, the metal and support for, for efficient and stable catalysts. And then we, we learn from Dr. Sun that uh, the, the carbon nanomaterials, um, porous graphene in particular can be produced from from uh, the reaction of CO2 and alkali metal, like lithium or sodium, uh, potassium, for example. Uh, Dr. San showed the way to utilize uh, CO2 uh, to produce different kinds of structures, depending on the, the type of metal, the ramping rate, the temperature used, for example. And these materials uh, are applicable in energy devices like zinc air battery, supercapacitor, solar cells, and so on. It, it's very interesting. And uh, Professor Patrick Porn gave a com comprehensive overview of CCU technology. And she highlights some recent work on thermal conversion of CO2 to methanol, assisted by liquid alcohol um, adding in the reaction system. Uh, she also showed the CCUS consortium um, activity initiated by, by her team at VCG Tech at Chulalongkorn University. And finally, Dr. Pusana, um, she uh, gave a uh, um, fundamental size of the, the CO2 RR reaction on how to control the selectivity of, of uh, ethylene and ethanol product from, from carbon dioxide react reductions. And it would bring to the, the new 
uh, knowledge to design more efficient and selective catalysts for uh, CO2 reductions. So in this morning session, I think we have learned uh, many uh, effective ways to utilize carbon dioxide. And, and uh, we hope that uh, everyone have learned and enjoy the talks for this morning session. And I think, uh, can we close the morning session now? Dr. Subhawadi, if we have any announcement or other things before we close the morning session? Yeah, we can close the morning session, but before um, you exit um, the WebEx or uh, after, uh, before you leave the session, we also um, would like to ask you to like to do the assessment form again in case of uh, someone that haven't done it yet. And in okay. the in the afternoon, we will have uh, we will still have five interesting talks. Um, we will start from one p.m. in Thai time. Uh, the talk will be like from academic uh, research to. Uh, the industrial research, which are very interesting, and we would like to invite you um, to come back to join in the afternoon session. Okay, okay, yeah. good. Stay with us, stay with us, and enjoy yes, your stay lunch. With us. And come back at yeah. 1 p.m. Thai time. Okay, thank you. Dr. Wani, you want to say something? Cup in yes. Just in brief, um, with my appreciation once again to our guest speakers for your great talks and very, very important contributions. Um, I do enjoy very much um, the very interesting questions and interactive atmosphere. And I'm sure that we can join hands for um, further development, which is very important for CCU technologies, both in Thailand and also in other countries, because this is global challenge now. So thank you so much. Enjoy your lunch. And um, I'm not sure whether I can join um, this afternoon session, but I will try because I have another parallel sessions in the afternoon. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to uh, the online seminar on CCU. And uh, for the afternoon, I am very pleased and honored to invite Ajahn Mehta to be the, the chairman for the afternoon session. Uh, Ajahn Mehta, Mehta Kulen Parmish um, currently is a uh, a uh, professor in uh, chemical engineering department in Gasset University. Um, he is a pioneer on the heterogeneous catalysis uh, and long been working in this field since I was a PhD student uh, <laughs> a long time ago. And <laughs> please welcome Ajahn Mehta. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Subhavadi, for your nice and kind introductions. Uh, let, let me start with uh, the, the in introductions of each of the, our speakers. Within this session, we will have five speakers, uh, two from the foreign uh, foreign country, and our, our other three speakers from uh, inside Thailand, from both uh, academics and industrial sectors. Should we start the program from now? It's okay now. Okay. Yeah. So let, let me introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is Professor Sun Xiang Yeo. He is a postdoctoral fellow in the chemical and chemical science division, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories and the Department of Chemical Bio Biomolecular Engineering. University of California, Berkeley. He joins National University of Singapore as an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and is group leaders of the solar fuel labs in Solar Energy Research Institute in Singapore. His research interests include developing catalysts for the electrochemical reductions of carbon dioxide to C2 and C3 hydrocarbons and alcohols, catalysis of oxygen and hydrogen evolution reactions, use of over spectroscopy for probing catalysts to develop a sustainable and environmentally friendly energy economies, 
For the topics of his presentation today will be electrochemical reductions of carbon dioxide to oxygenate and hydrocarbon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Welcome, Professor Yeo. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, could you see my slides? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so I, I, I begin by um, thanking um, the organizers for so kindly um, giving me this opportunity to be here to um, share with you my work. <clears throat> Oops, let me see. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is really what we are interested to develop in our laboratory, um, an electrochemical system to reduce carbon dioxide to uh, chemicals and fuels. Uh, let me walk you through the system very brief, very quickly. Um, we have these red and green um, rods. These represent electrocatalysts. The red one is the cathode, and then the green one is the anode. If you immerse these two rods into an electrochemical cell, you can fill it up with water, you can bubble carbon dioxide, and then you apply a, a voltage across these two rods, what will happen is on the anodic compartment, on the anode, water oxidizes to oxygen gas. And then the electrons will then go into the cathode. And depending on what the cathode is, um, its chemical composition, its uh, oxidation state, um, it is possible to convert carbon dioxide to different types of products. Yeah? So this is really what we are interested to develop in our lab. And uh, the focus of today's talk is to develop catalysts that are lasting, active, and selective towards the conversion of CO2 to um, multi-carbon mo molecules, in particular oxygenates and alcohols. So I'll be sharing with all of you uh, four stories. Um, the first is how to um, increase um, ethanol selectivity. The second, is how to convert CO2 to methanol. And then number three, how do you convert formic acid to methanol? And then finally, how do we convert CO2 to 1-butanol, which is a C4 molecule, and also to C1 to C6 hydrocarbons. In other words, some sort of uh, electrochemical fischer tropsch reaction. Uh, let's see. Okay, so just a brief overview of, um, of CO2 reduction. Very briefly, uh, actually, the, so sorry, the, the first papers on this topic was actually published um, 90 years ago, back in the 1930s on CO2 reduction. It was actually made on mercury. Huh? But uh, after that, we have to wait till about 1980s, 1990s, where we have uh, electrochemist from Japan, Yoshio Hori. And he did, I would say, a lot of the pioneering work in this topic, a lot of work, which a lot of results, which we understand now, really um, is thanks to him. So we can actually divide um, the different transition metals into four categories, uh, depending on how they react with CO2. So the first category over here, we have um, nickel, iron, platinum, titanium. You could see that the dominant product that is formed is actually hydrogen. So what happened here is that um, CO2, at least we know for sure on nickel and platinum, is that CO2 reduces to CO, but the CO is bound very, very strongly on these two surfaces. And so it poisons the surface. And so instead of getting CO2 reduction products, you get hydrogen evolution products. The second category of metals, which includes um, lead, mercury, indium, tin, and so on, um, CO2 reduces to uh, forming acid. So essentially, the molecule comes onto the surface, receives proton electrons. Uh, hmm? Sorry? It receives protons, electrons, and then um, it leaves the surface as forming acid, and none of the CO bonds are broken. We have the third category, which includes um, gold, silver, and zinc. You could see that carbon monoxide is the dominant product. Well, the reason is because after CO is formed, 
it is not bound strong enough on the surface. And so it leaves as a CO product. And then finally, we have the final metal in the category, which is copper. And copper is unique because not only does it produce forming acid and CO, it can also give you a wide range of C1 to C3 hydrocarbons and alcohols. So this is really the good news. The not so good news is that um, copper reduces CO2 in a very unselective way. And so the big question is, how can we make the reduction more selective? Um, let me show you um, a data um, that is uh, a, a very detailed study of CO2 reduction on copper that was made about 10 years ago. Um, you can see that there are at least um, 15 different carbonaceous products that can be formed from CO2 reduction on copper. If you include hydrogen gas, it be the 16 products. Um, you could see that the process is extremely unselective. Uh, most of the products form are C1s and C2s. Um, you could see that molecules such as methanol, which is a very simple molecule, you know, is formed with ferritic efficiency less than 1%. Um, you know, other simple molecules like propylene, um, butanol, you know, they have, they have not been detected. So the question is, uh, can we make copper more selective? Well, you can do so by um, tweaking the type of cations and anions that are present in the electrolyte. If I switch from perchlorate to chloride bromide iodide, you could see that the amount of C2s goes up. Uh, so this is um, ethylene and ethanol. Um, you will notice also from this data that there tends to be more ethylene form than ethanol. Uh, we will we'll, we'll come back to this in a while. I can also change the cations in my electrolyte. And similarly, you know, I could actually produce more CO2 reduction products. Um, what else can I do? I can use what is commonly now known as oxide derived copper for CO2 reduction. Um, what you could do is to take a piece of copper foil, you can heat it up in an oven and you can produce a layer of copper oxide on the foil. It has been shown that uh, if you use this sample, you could actually produce quite a bit of forming acid and carbon monoxide with better um, ferritic efficiency and energetic efficiency as compared to say um, normal polycrystalline copper. Um, our group in the NUS, a couple of years ago, we also used the same material. And what we found is that you could actually use the same material to produce quite a fair amount of ethylene and ethanol. So these are C2 products. Um, you could see once again that there tends to be more ethylene form than ethanol. Now what is happening here, um, um, there was a, actually a theoretical work that was published uh, back in 2013 already. And what is generally believed is that um, CO2 reduces to CO, and then the two CO molecules dimerize uh, to give us a C2 intermediate. And then the C2 intermediate continues to reduce. And at some point, we will get a CH2, CHO intermediate, uh, which can then either reduce to ethylene and ethanol. And it appears that the ethylene pathway has a lower energy barrier. And this explains why there tend to be more ethylene formed than ethanol. And this takes place pretty nicely on copper 100 sites. So <clears throat> one of the questions that can be asked is, is it possible to further increase the formation of C2s, especially ethanol, because it's a nice liquid fuel? It turns out that uh, experimentally, if you add metals like zinc or silver, um, by themselves, these are CO producing catalysts, you can actually increase the ethylene and ethanol production. So what is commonly believed is that um, CO2 reduces to um, CO on zinc or silver, and then the CO sort of jumps across onto copper, and then is further reduced to C2 products via the COCO dimerization mechanism. But this mechanism does not explain why sometimes you can actually see more ethanol being formed. So this is what I want to uh, 
share with you now on why it is possible that sometimes you actually see more ethanol production. Now, what is happening here? <coughs> um, so this is our first story. Um, if I do CO2 reduction on um, oxide derived copper nanowires, but it can also be copper nanoparticles, you will see that there is more ethylene being formed than ethanol. Yeah. This is nothing special. Um, if I do the same experiment on silver nanoparticles, you could see that a lot of CO is being formed. Again, no surprise. We know that silver gives us CO. <coughs> if I mix copper and silver together, and assuming that um, these two metals don't interact with each other, or the products that are formed from these two catalysts don't react with each other, what I should expect to see is a simple addition of products. That is to say, um, on the copper-silver mixture, I should see more ethylene, some ethanol, and lots of CO. But what we saw over here now in this data is that actually more ethanol can now be formed compared to ethylene. Uh, so this, is, this suggests that there is some sort of a synergy going on okay, between the catalyst or the products. And uh, what you notice, what we notice over here also is that the amount of CO that is produced is actually much lesser than we expect it to be. We suggest that the CO produced on silver may have further reacted to give us the ethanol. So what is happening here? Uh, we could actually do more experiments to try to understand this phenomenon. Um, we could do so by adding more and more silver into our system while keeping copper constant. And you could see that uh, when you add more and more silver, which is to say you add, you generate more and more CO molecules, you could see that the ethanol signal increases, but the ethylene signal stays fairly constant. And the same here, if I increase the silver surface area by using smaller silver particles, uh, you could see once again that the ethanol goes up while the ethylene stays fairly constant. Now, what is the mechanism here? Um, if you look at it at first sight, it appears that, oh, you know, this is easy to understand. Uh, most probably the silver generates CO and then the CO jumps onto copper and it reacts via the COCO dimerization mechanism. But uh, if this is the case, we should expect to see more ethylene rather than ethanol, right? So clearly there must be some alternative mechanism going on. Um, so we actually turned to our collaborators to help us understand better uh, this phenomenon. And uh, what they taught us is as follows, that um, you can indeed produce CO on silver, but then uh, the, the CO quickly jumps over onto copper. Mm -hmm. And the CO, and it appears that there are copper 111 sites on our substrates. Uh, and uh, the CO can actually couple can actually reduce to CH and CH can actually couple with a CO molecule to give us a CHCO intermediate. And it seems that this CHCO intermediate, once it is formed, it can be reduced all the way to ethanol. Right? In fact, you don't actually form ethylene from this particular pathway over here. So um, this mechanism actually kind of explain why when we add the silver to copper, and we do CO2 reduction using this composite, um, all we saw is an is an extra production of ethanol. Right? And it's because there is actually a new uh, mechanism happening here. Um, the, the next story which I want to share with all of you is our work on producing methanol. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, it is very difficult to form methanol on copper. Um, you typically, if you try to do a screening study, you find that the current and the ferric efficiency is extremely low. So what is happening here? Uh, what I want to show you now is that <clears throat> it is possible to combine two metals by themselves. They are not CO producing, but if you put them together, it is actually possible to form a catalyst that produces methanol. So this is the um, this is how we do it. 
we actually make a silver foam substrate by electrochemical deposition of silver part silver onto um, a silver substrate and then we pulse deposit zinc particles onto the silver we can characterize using SEM, we can use XPS, XRD, and so on. The important point to take home is that um, the zinc tends to stay on top of the silver. And when we do CO2 reduction with this uh, substrate, this catalyst, you find that uh, it can actually produce about 8.1% methanol. Actually, we are still, this is still an experiment which we are thinking about and you know, on how to improve we went to about 15% later um, of methanol. Uh, the current is about 2 milliamps per cm square. Uh, if I do the same experiment on zinc, you could see that uh, it also produces some methanol, but not as much as the silver zinc uh, catalyst. Um, there is no methanol produced on silver itself. So what this experiment really suggests is the zinc catalyst that is deposited on silver is probably responsible for giving methanol. So how do we understand this then? Again, we uh, did some theory with our collaborators on this. We modeled different um, silver zinc substrates. There are a lot of details, but essentially we found that um, after CO reduces, no, after CO2 reduces, reduces to CO, only the um, lowly coordinated um, compressed sites, zinc sites, can actually uh, absorb CO strong enough such that CO can further reduce to give you methanol. If I look, for example, at zinc or silver or even a layer of zinc lying on top of silver, it does not hold the CO strong enough for it to further reduce, okay? So only um, really little atoms Zinc atoms on silver is good enough to convert CO2 to, 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 to CO and then finally to methanol. So here is the, the mechanism that uh, we propose um, that CO2 first reduces to um, CO, which then reduces to formaldehyde, methoxy, and finally to methanol. Of course, we can test out this mechanism by reducing both carbon monoxide and formaldehyde, and you could see in both cases, uh, methanol is formed. In contrast, if I try to reduce formic acid, uh, uh, it does not give me methanol. Okay, so it shows me that uh, this proposed mechanism is likely to be true. Now, you could see that uh, it is extremely difficult um, to form methanol from CO2. So the question is, uh, is there a different strategy to make methanol from CO2? So um, it is known, and I've shown you just now, that uh, I can take CO2, I can convert CO2 to CO, and then CO can actually be converted to different molecules, right? So this first substrate could be silver, and then the second substrate could be copper. If I use substrates such as lead, indium, tin, CO2 can actually be converted to um, formic acid. And typically, formic acid is an end product. Uh, it does not further reduce anymore. So the question here to ask is, can we convert formic acid to methanol? Uh, um, if I look at um, the textbooks, textbook reactions, what we discover is that uh, formic acid can actually be very easily reduced to methanol if I use lithium aluminum hydride. So this is a known um, stoichiometric reagent. Uh, I definitely recall doing this experiment when I was a first year um, organic chemistry student. Um, but of course, this reaction... Um, produces a lot of waste. Electrochemically, it's extremely difficult to do so. Um, it's actually a known problem already back in, in the um, textbooks. And the only known conversion of formic acid to, C, to uh, methanol is that formic acid sort of breaks down to give you CO, and then CO can somehow reduce methanol. Now, how do we do it? 
to cut, cut the long story short, what we found is that uh, if you anodize titanium, um, the anodized titanium can actually reduce formic acid to methanol. Uh, um, we have a uh, fair deficiency of about 12%. Um, we have now optimized it to about 40% now. Now, what is happening here? We actually did quite a bit of characterization using uh, EPR and using cyclic photometry, and we discovered that actually um, when you anodize titanium and then you do a formic acid reduction using this substrate, um, you actually form oxygen vacancies on this substrate. And these oxygen vacancies are actually responsible for formic acid production. You could see from this data over here, the uh, figures C and F, that um, when you have more and more oxygen vacancies, the, formic, the, the methanol production actually goes up. Uh, now, again, how do we understand this? Uh, we did theory to try to help us to understand this. Um, and there are actually two possible mechanisms that have been proposed. The first mechanism, formic acid reduces to formaldehyde, and then formaldehyde reduces to methanol. The second mechanism, formic acid reduces very, very quickly to methanol, very early on. Okay, uh, Essentially, what happens is the vacancy pulls out the oxygen from formic acid to give you methanol. And um, so the one of, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is, is formaldehyde really not an intermediate? And the way we study this is quite straightforward. Um, we do a spike pass, okay? So um, if I spike formaldehyde during the experiment, you could see that the current is actually ex it's actually kind of a flat, okay, which, which basically means that um, formaldehyde is electrochemically inert. Whereas if I spike with forming acid, you could see that uh, uh, there is a change in current. So it tells us right away that um, the first mechanism which I propose here is unlikely to be true, okay, that formaldehyde is not reactive. Um, let me go on to my... Uh, well, probably this is my last story eh, because I think my time seems to be running out. Um, it's actually very difficult to form uh, multi-carbon products uh, uh, from, from CO2. And why is this the case? Well, it appears that um, to form a multi-carbon product, um, you need to have, you need to convert CO2 to CO and then the CO has to sort of um, couple through a Flory-Schutz distribution mechanism. Uh, so what this basically means is that if you have a molecule with very few carbon atoms, they can be formed quite easily. Whereas if you have a lot of carbon atoms, it could be very hard to, to make them. So what I want to, I'm, I'm going to show you in the next two or three slides is that it is actually possible to form a C4 alcohol, okay? Um, in this case, one butanol. Um, and the mechanism is actually not through a... C plus CO plus CO plus CO plus CO coupling. So this is our experimental setup. Okay, it's actually a very simple copper oxide derived um, GDE experiment. And uh, we use uh, HPLC and GC to detect our products. This is very straightforward. And what we found using this substrate is that you can produce quite a bit of C2s and C3s. But what is very notable is that you we form butanol and butanel. So this is the alcohol and this is the aldehyde. Um, the interesting part about this experiment over here is that we did not see any 2-butanol. And this is curious because um, it tells us something about the mechanism. Um, because the fact that we saw only 1-butanol and one and then butanol and not 2-butanol really suggests to us that um, the C4 backbone cannot possibly be made um, by the coupling of 4-CO molecules. And because if the 4-CO couples, we should see some butanol, I mean some 2-butanol, but, but we, which we didn't. Now, just to keep the long story short, this is actually what we found okay, by uh, reducing different intermediates. 
what we found is that uh, CO2 reduces to acetaldehyde, and then acetaldehyde actually undergoes a surface-mediated aldo condensation. So this is a typical organic chemistry reaction. And once you produce crotonaldehyde, which is the C4 backbone, it reduces, it can only reduce really um, to either to butanol or to butanol, right? Of course, you can form a little bit of crotonic alcohol as well. Yeah? But essentially, there is no way you can form um, two butanol from this process. Now, you can see from this reaction mechanism, uh, and so what I've written here, that the uh, ferric efficiency for butanol is really, really low, about 0.056%, okay? Um, now, what is the reason for that? The main reason really is um, CO2 to acetaldehyde is extremely difficult, okay? And of course, if you cannot form this very important intermediate, it's going to be very hard to form butanol. Now, how do you go about dealing with this issue? One possibility is to try to reduce crotonaldehyde, okay? Crotonaldehyde to butanol. Um, how do we do it? It turns out that a great catalyst for converting crotonaldehyde to butanol is actually iron, iron catalyst over here, okay? Um, and we found that if you structure the catalyst such that it has a lot of grain boundaries and a lot of strain sites, you can actually convert um, crotonaldehyde to butanol relatively easily, as seen by from this data over here. The um, ferric efficiency comes to about 60%. Now, if you do not have the strain sites over here, okay, uh, what happens is you tend to form more butanol over here, okay, um, unless you apply a much more negative potential and then butanol ends up as butanol. So this is actually shown by this data over here that at low over potentials on the on the iron foil, you tend to form butanol, but then when you increase the potential to more negative, butanol is formed. Okay, I want to go now just a very, very quick point here. And the question is, is nickel a poor catalyst for reducing CO2? And actually, if I look at all the existing um, literature data, it does appear to be the case. Um, you can see over here that uh, nickel gives you a lot of hydrogen. Okay, there's hardly any hydrocarbons and so on. Um, but what I'm going to show you now is that it is actually possible to make nickel active. And how do we do it? Um, what we found is that if you use nickel oxygenates for the experiment, that means in other words, um, nickel phosphates, nickel hydroxides, and so on, we could actually produce um, C1 to C6 hydrocarbons. Huh? Um, you could see that the ferric efficiency can go up to about 15% of, of hydrocarbons, C1 to C6. Um, you can form linear hydrocarbons. You can form branch hydrocarbons. Okay, for example, for example, you can form hexane. Um, so what is really happening here? Um, sort of cut a long story short, we did uh, operando XFs. We could do um, CO stripping experiment. And we found that actually there's nickel plus sites that are present and it, during the CO2 reduction itself. And this nickel plus sites actually do not bind to CO strong, strongly. In fact, it's quite loosely bound. And so this allows the CO to further reduce, to react, to give you these C1 to C6 hydrocarbons. Huh? Um, so I think this comes to the end of at the end of my talk, um, um, these are the five points which uh, I hope that I have shared with all of you nicely. And I want to, uh, again, um, um, thank the organizers for so kindly having me to share with you my work. I thank my collaborators and my uh, co-workers and uh, funding uh, from the NUS, the uh, Ministry of Education, for their kind support. And I thank all of you for your kind attention. Thank you.
ตอนนี้การเล่นเปิดไหมว่าขอบใจ Oh, sorry. Okay. Do we have? Thank you very much for your nice presentation. Do we have any questions from the floor? Okay. Let me have one short question. Yes. Right. That is a question in the chat box as well. Okay. I I see. Uh, let me try to find it. Uh. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Actually, I don't know where's the chat box. <laughs> Can you see that? I, I will read for you. Okay. May I ask, in your opinion, which product is the easiest to make and possibly earn high selectivity with electrochemical CO2 reduction methods? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um. Uh, well, actually, the, the the easiest product to make um would be well, at least from from what we know from the literature. Is actually carbon monoxide and formic acid. Yeah. Uh, these two molecules, um, the conversion of CO2 to these two molecules can be almost one. I mean, the Faraday efficiency could be close to 100, if not 100. So these two molecules are the easiest to make: uh, CO2 to CO, or CO2 to formic acid. But because these are um, relatively easier molecules to make, um, I think that. Um, the next easiest it appears to be it seems to me to be ethylene. I think the Faraday efficiency can go up to sixty percent right right now. Yeah. Okay, this is the question from Professor Patraphorn. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I think time is up now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very we can much. Can discuss again at the end of the session. Okay. Thank sure, you. Thank you. Okay, let, let me introduce the second speaker, Professor Kung Min Choi. Professor Kung Min Choi was the postdoctoral fellow in Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories, Department of Chemistry, University of California, currently as an associate professor in chemical and bio, biological engineering department, Sok, Sok Myung Women's University. His research interests include synthesis of high, highly polar materials, for example, morph carbon nanotube, graphene, metal nanoparticles, carbon nanotube hybrid materials for carbon dioxide capture and conversion, electrochemical energy storage, and light harvesting reactions. The topics of his talk today will be designs of metal organic frameworks and polyhydrate Polyhedral for catalysis. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Welcome, Professor Choi. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyungmin Choi in Sungmyung Women's University in South Korea. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and it's my honor to make a presentation uh, in this conference. And, and what I'm going to talk today is a catalytic application of metal organic framework and metal organic polyhedra. So uh, I'm going to introduce the metal organic framework and tell you how uh, we can use this metal organic framework in catalytic applications. And I'm mostly focused on introducing metal organic polyhedra for catalytic applications. So uh, let me first tell you what is the metal organic framework. Maybe most of you know that, but I want uh, I'll briefly tell you the concept of metal organic framework, which we call as MOP. So metal organic framework is like a building or apartment built by the molecule and molecular uh, tenant can live in there. So we can make uh, buildings like an apartment we live in uh, using the spacer here and the joint. So if we connect all the spacers and joint together, we can make a three-dimensional structure uh, as we see like this, and we can create a space inside, and we can use this space for uh, gas storage or gas separation or the catalytic reactions. 
So if one molecule come in this area, this space and convert it to the other molecules, so this uh, space can be used for catalytic reactions and we can control and we can design this space for uh, control the catalytic reaction pathways. So what we need is a spacer and joint and we can connect them together to make a three-dimensional structure and space. So in metal organic framework, we use the organic structure or organic unit as a spacer. And we also use the metal oxide cluster as a joint. And we stitch them together or connect them together to make a space uh, like this. So yellow ball inside is the space we can use. And in catalytic applications, this yellow ball is a space that molecule make reaction. So by controlling the environment of the pore or space, we can control the catalytic reaction pathways. So this uh, space can be extended uh, infinitely to make um, high surface area structures like apartment. So the uniqueness of the metal organic framework, uh, I think, is three. The first one is a high porous dense surface area because all molecules are exposed to the outside and they make a surface area. So by making a metal organic framework, we can give a high surface area. And the other important feature of the MOP is the uh, designability. So we can design or we can change the organic linker part and metal oxide cluster to design or change geometry uh, of the pore. Or we can also make isolated curious structure. And we can also control the pore size and shape and opening. And we can also control the chemical properties and physical properties of the pore. So it's exactly like an apartment. In the apartment, you uh, install the air conditioner and TV and the refrigerator for your living. And we can also design the molecular space inside of a mob by using these design abilities. So especially for the catalytic reactions, by designing Designing a space making reaction, we can also uh, control the reaction pathway or reaction yield or many things in catalytic reactions. And once you make uh, uh, a metal organic framework by your own design, uh, you may mix them together in the in the lab and you make something there. And after designing and synthesis of your material, uh, you need to see if your design is uh, realized in, in the materials. So in metal organic framework, by using a crystallinity, you can find or you can examine if your design is really uh, realized in molecular level. So this three picture is important picture for metal organic framework uh, and especially for the catalytic reactions. So, uh, there is many advantages using MOP in catalytic reactions. If you see the structure here, uh, you can do many things to make an uh, active point for catalytic reactions. So you can make, uh, you can uh, place the metal nanoparticles inside or outside of MOP, and you can also make a functional groups or a specific point to make reactions. And we can also make a defect site, and this specs defect site is usually active for the catalytic reactions. So if you make a reactions in gas page, the gas reactant diffusing uh, easily inside of MOP and make a reaction in the space we design, then the gas product can be go out, uh, can go out. So the reaction goes very well. And by designing a space inside of a metal organic framework, we can also design the pathway. Let me show you the example. So this is the work that I have done in Berkeley, and I worked with Dr. Banyare at that time. And in this experiment, we make metal organic framework nanoparticles here. And we also had a platinum nanoparticle inside of a metal organic framework. And we also had met, uh, platinum nanoparticles outside of a metal organic framework crystals. And then, 
Uh, we make a reaction to convert methyl cyclopentane to make an olefin or acrylic isomer or the cyclohexane benzene or cracking compound. And what we found is that by having a metal nanoparticle inside the mob, we can make a reaction in the temperature uh, lower than the reaction temperature, normal reaction temperature. And then we also designed the, uh, the space uh, size of the pore or size of the space uh, by controlling the structure of the metal organic framework. So uh, this structure has the smallest pore and this structure has the largest pore and they show different catalytic pathways. So we found that by designing um, pore sites, we can also design the catalytic pathways. And we also found that uh, the, chem uh, the chem functionality, chemical functionality also control the reaction pathway. And this is a previous work. But what I found out is that the using a metal organic framework in gas phase, gas phase reaction is very easy because there is no traffic or diffusion issues. But many people want to use metal organic framework for catalytic reaction in in organic organic reaction or catalytic reaction in solvent liquid state. In liquid state, the reactants are solvated. They are very difficult to diffuse in and make a reaction and diffuse out. And because they the solvated uh, reactant have big size, they cannot easily go in and and uh, making a reaction is very hard. And after making a reaction, uh, they cannot easily uh, go out from the metal organic framework. So even if we have many active points, like metal nanoparticles or functional groups, we cannot use them easily. And so usually the, uh, the catalytic reaction using MOP in liquid state, their yield was very low. So uh, my idea was what about making them in a nano size until they have one um, unit cell per particles. So if they have, if the mob have one unit cell per particles, there is no catalytic issues, but uh, still we can use the advantages of mob structure like a defect site or metal nanoparticles or functional groups. And they can make a reaction uh, very well uh, compared to metal organic framework itself because they uh, have a lot of freedom to make a reaction and diffusion is not prohibited. So what I have done, what I've found is the metal organic polyhedra. Uh, the metal organic polyhedra is different with the metal organic framework because uh, the connecting points are terminated partially terminated. So they, they don't make a, a extended structure, but they make a cage-like structures. The structure of the metal organic polyhedra is exactly the same with the metal organic framework, but they can be uh, divided into the particles having one unicell. And I, and um, in this case, we make a zirconium-based metal organic polyhedra and this metal organic polyhedra is very stable even in the uh, aqueous reactions. So I decided to use them for a uh, photocatalytic reaction to convert the carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. So the uh, first subject is the, the highly active and lowest photocatalyst heteronized in discrete cages of metal organic polyhedra for carbon dioxide reduction. So uh, what we use as a catalyst is linium tricarbonyl complexes. And this linium tricarbonyl complexes is well known for converting carbon dioxide into the carbon monoxide uh, with 100% uh, selectivity. And this is a protocatalyst. So once they are uh, exposed to the, uh, to the sunlight, they make a uh, electrons to make reactions. So this organic um, 
organometallic catalyst is very efficient and their uh, activity was very good. But their drawback was stability. So once they make reactions, their catalytic uh, activity is totally lost uh, because of the dimerization. So people want to enhance the stability of the linear tricarbonate complex by binding them in the heteronized catalyst like nanoparticles or MOP. But uh, well, they uh, succeeded in the enhanced the, the stability at the expense of the activity. So they increased the stability, but activity was always bad. And this was also uh, the story for the metal organic framework and uh, all of the heteronized catalysts. So what I want to find out, find out is that how to enhance the activity uh, and, and stability together. Uh, and I try to make a different type of metal organic framework having uh, linear tricarbonate complexes. First, we uh, bind the linear tricarbonate complex in the mop, and we found that the stability is very high because they don't uh, reduce the reactions. But the amount of reaction is much smaller than the molecular catalysts. Because molecular catalysts make a bunch of reactions in the initially, but they don't make a reaction anymore. So their stability is very low. Even if the, the MOP having a uh, linear tribe carbon complex has a high stability, their activity was very low. So what I have done is uh, uh, combining metal organic framework with the silver nanoparticle to use the plasmony enhancement effect. So plasmony enhancement uh, make a, a strong sunlight or strong energy. So the linear tricarbonate complex uh, uh, in metal organic framework make uh, uh, boosted reactions. But even if we use the uh, plasmon uh, enhancement, their activity was still lower, much lower than the molecular catalyst. So uh, molecular catalysts make uh, this much reactions initially, and they don't make reaction anymore. And in case of a silver nanoparticle combined with MOP, uh, takes 24 hours to, to overcome the amount of uh, carbon monoxide uh, uh, to exceed the amount of carbon monoxide from the molecular catalyst. And I also try to combine the, this linear tricarbonate complex with the amine group, but uh, the result was marginal. So at that time, my idea was, uh, what about using metal organic polyhedra? Because they have one unit set per particles, the sunlight go in very well, and the diffusion issue is not there. So what we wanted to do is the, uh, enhance the activity and the stability together. And normally we cannot, uh, we cannot have the uh, high, high activity uh, heteronized compound because of the, the diffusion or the sunlight issues. So I combined the, the linear tricarbonate complexes uh, in the metal organic polyhedra. And once we make a metal organic polyhedra, they make uh, crystals and all of the particles or cages are arranged very well in the crystal structure. And this is a crystal. And we found that there is a zirconium and linium together. Zirconium is the uh, metal oxide cluster to make a structure and the linium is from linium tricarbonate complex. Then if you see the STM image, uh, the particles, they, uh, you can see the particles over there, and these particle size is 1.76 nanometer, and these particles are the metal organic polyhedra in the cages. And from the XLD structure, uh, XLD analysis, we found that uh, the metal, uh, metal organic polyhedra have the structure we uh, expected.
And then once you put these crystals inside of the alcohol, uh, like methanol, uh, all of the cages are, are distributed. And the crystal is broken, but uh, metal organic polyhedral cages is um, distributed very well in the solvent. And then we measure the ESI mass to see how many uh, linear tricarbon complexes are combined in the cage structures. And we found that there is no, there is MOP having no RTC, but there, there also is, there also are one, two, three uh, linear tricarbon complexes uh, combined in the metal organic polyhedral. And we also tested the uh, linear tricarbon complex has the same geometry as their linker, and we found that uh, their linker is uh, still uh, maintained, and their the amount of linker is one point five uh, per uh, metal organic polyhedral cages, and in IR analysis, their carbonyl group is the same as the molecules, so even if uh, linear tricarbon complex is bound to the uh, metal organic polyhedra, their chemical configuration was the same as molecules. And then we tested the activity and uh, stability uh, of the linear tricarbon complexes. So if you remember this graph, this is a metal uh, linear tricarbon complex molecules and they make a bunch of reactions and they don't make a reaction anymore. But uh, once you combine this RETC, linear tricarbon complex, with the MOF, uh, you can uh, increase the stability with low activity. But if you see the graph in the right hand side, uh, this red one is RETC MOP, uh, which is the metal organic polyhedra having linear tricarbon complexes. And the gray one here is the molecular catalyst. And the blue one is the linear tricarbon complex MOF in nanosites. And yellow one is the RTC MOF in micron size. And this one is MOP uh, with no RTC. And then if you see the red one here is that the activity was very high and they never die. And so uh, we concluded that uh, they have uh, they have a high activity without losing their uh, stability. But in case of the, the RETC molecular catalyst, they have, uh, initially they have a high uh, activity, but uh, because of low stability, they lose their uh, catalytic activities. So we found that RETC MOP is the best one, and they don't lose their activity and maintaining the high activity for, for whole reactions. And then we wanted to find out why um, this happened. So we uh, divided them in different sites. Uh, RETC molecular catalysts have one, uh, less than one nanometer size, and RETC metal organic polyhedra have one nanometer size. And then nano size has has 100 nanometer and micro size has micro size. And as the size of the particle increased, their stability was, uh, their stability was enhanced uh, with uh, decreased the, the activity. And in the size of the metal organic polyhedra, they have the high activity and stability. So by having um, one uh, unicell per particle, and their size is the one nanometer, so they can maintain their high activity without losing stability. And then we also uh, try to figure out if the carbon dioxide conversion is nearly coming from the lithium tricarbon complex inside of the MOP, then we cut, uh, we uh, control the, the wavelengths of the light and if their uh, activity is following their absorption curve, and their absorption curve and their activity curve was uh, matched, which means that 
uh, linear tricarbon complex in the MOP really work for the converting carbon dioxide into the carbon monoxide. And we also uh, feed uh, 13 CO2 to make 13 CO, and we confirmed that the, the carbon dioxide reaction is really coming from the uh, linear tricarbonate complex in MOP. And then we also uh, tested uh, the stability, if the structure of the MOP is stable after reactions. So after 24-hour reactions, we collect them and we tested uh, their mass and IR spectroscopy. And, and their mass, uh, the, the mass spectroscopy was the same as before the reactions. And in, in IR spectroscopy, it shows that the carbonyl uh, stretch is exactly the same with uh, the RDTC before the reaction. So the stability of the structure uh, of RDTC MOP is very high. And then uh, we also saw that uh, if the sunlight go easily into the MOP structure compared with uh, MOF, in case of MOF, they have low sorption, uh, but the RDTC MOP have a high sorption. Uh, high amount of absorption intensity. So, which means that the MOP is advantageous to uh, get light easily from the outside to make a photocatalytic reactions. And then we report this one as uh, in environment and uh, energy and environmental science, and our paper was selected at the cover. And the other work I want to introduce today is the using MOP. Uh, for Suzuki Miyamura coupling, cross coupling reactions in aqueous media. So, in this study, uh, we anchor the platinum catalyst in the zirconium based MOP, metal organic polyhedra, and apply them to uh, Suzuki Miyamura cross coupling reactions. So, strategy was the same as previous photocatalytic studies. So we have a bipyridine linker and we build up uh, the MOP structure with the zirconium cluster and the bipyridine linker. And then uh, in post-synthetic modifications, we anchor the platinum uh, PDCL2 uh, into the pyridine structure. So what we expected, uh, what we expect is the structure like this. So this is the MOP having platinum uh, uh, ions anchored in bipyridine site. And because uh, zirconium cluster have the plus charge, and they can be uh, sorbated or distributed very well in aqueous medium. Then we use this uh, catalyst for uh, Suzuki Miyamura coupling reactions in aqueous mediums. Uh, we first synthesized the uh, MOP having bipyridine linker, and we analyzed the structure of the MOP. And by uh, by inserting them in the uh, alcohol, like a uh, methanol, uh, all of the MOP cages are distributed very well. And then uh, palladium was anchored in the water. We also analyzed the, the mass of the uh, palladium anchor the MOP, and we found that there's a two, three, four, five, six uh, palladium uh, was anchored in uh, in the cage of metal organic polyhedra. Then we also found that uh, there is the uh, average 4.5 pal uh, palladium atoms anchored in one uh, MOP cages. And we also checked the IR spectroscopy if there is uh, platinum anchored. Uh, because they are very tiny particles and, and, and they have one nanometer uh, sizes and they have a very good interaction with um, water because of the plus charge existing in zirconium uh, metal oxide clusters. So they can be distributed very well and they never been 
uh, segregated uh, in the longest time. And we also uh, applied this MOP, uh, palladium anchored MOP for Suzuki Miyamura cross coupling reactions. And their reaction yield was very good. If we see the table two, uh, their reaction yield was uh, almost uh, over the 90%. And we compared the uh, MOP with uh, molecular palladium uh, bipyridine compound and the MOF compound. And MOP shows uh, uh, much better uh, conversion efficiencies than the molecular catalyst or the MOF catalyst. And then after the reaction, we tested the reusability. So they are very distributed in the aqueous media, but once they are centrifuged, uh, the all of the MOP was collected easily, and then they can be redispersed in the aqueous media. After the redispersion, uh, we uh, tested the, the same reaction if the reaction goes well uh, to test the reusability, and uh, the reaction was very good. Uh, upon the, the three number of reaction cycles. And uh, yeah, these are my students. I, I want to thank you for uh, my sponsors and, and, the, and the audiences and, and organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Schweiz, for your informative talks on MOV and also many applications. I think we can go have very short period for uh, questions from the from from the panels. Yeah. Okay. L let me ask one one very simple questions. When when you mentioned about the use of the morph uh, in the liquid phase liquid reactions and when we have the trouble with the diffusion limitations sorry yeah. can you say that again okay uh, when when we work with if we want to work with the morph and uh, the the situation and and the condition is in the liquid phase reactions and in the case we have the trouble with the diffusion limitations of the particle size or some things. Do you have some suggestions for to resolve these kinds of troubles? Oh yeah, my approach was actually reducing the size of the particle of the mop. So by decreasing the size, they can be distributed very well and the diffusion pathway can be short. So in the extension of the smalling, uh, the particle size, I wanted to make a particles having one unicell, which is a metal organic polyhedra. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I think if we have the one question from uh, the panels, Dr. Bunjarat, the question is, uh, have you tried to use metal organic layers instead of metal organic polyhedra? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have tried to use a two-dimensional material organic structure like a layer, but it was difficult to exfoliate them. Uh, yeah, to exfoliate them to have one sheet of the material organic structures. So that's why, uh, in case of the the metal organic polyhedra, it's very easy to disperse them uh, in the organic solvent because you can just put the methanol into the structure and all of the cages are well distributed. So uh, I choose the metal organic polyhedra instead of two-dimensional metal organic structure. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again for your presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let me move to the third speaker. Our third speaker will be Professor Tong Tai Wit Chun. He works at the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University. His research interests include the synthesis of porous silica materials separation process, catalysis, specifically for the conversions of 
carbon dioxide and biomass to value added chemicals. Among the honors, she has received the National Young Scientist Award, Thailand Frontier Research Award, the Petroleum Institute of Thailand Scholar Award, and the TRF OHEX Scopus Research Award for the research area relevant to carbon dioxide utilization. The topics of his talk will be a key structures of uh, iron based catalyst for selective carbon dioxide hydrogenation to light olefins. Please join me welcome as Professor Tong Thai. Okay, uh, yeah. thanks Professor Meta for the nice introduction and good afternoon everyone. Uh, everyone hear me? Uh, Professor Meta hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Tong Thai Vitun. I come from the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering, Kassasad University. And what I'm going to talk today is about the work that I have been doing for 10 years at Kassasad University on the carbon dioxide capture and utilization. And the topics of my presentation is a key structure of island-based catalyst for selective carbon dioxide hydrogenation to light olefin. Now, let us start by introducing the energy consumption, which is uh, directly related to the carbon dioxide emission. And as you can see, we obtain the energy from different sources, including oil, natural gas, coal, bioenergy, nuclear, hydroelectricity, and other renewable. And we can see that the energy consumption uh, still increased from 2019 to 2040 um, for the reduction of poverty and for better life condition. And looking to the nat natural gas, uh, the demand will increase up to 31% for affordable and reliable uh, electrical power generation that produce a uh, lower emission than coal. And the demand of oil uh, still increased about 21% due to the growth in petrochemicals. And we can see that 70% uh, of the total energy consumption mainly emit carbon dioxide into atmosphere. And we can see that the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increased over year. And now it is about uh, 420 parts per million. And this large volume of carbon dioxide is causing environmental damage. So um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is it difficult to stop using oil, natural gas, and coal? So um, the energy consumption from those sources must be used with uh, carbon capture storage and utilization technology. Um, for anyone who start working on the carbon dioxide emission chemistry, I would strongly encourage you guys to read this paper published in Nature of Climate Change. Um, five years ago, in which the role of carbon dioxide capture and utilization is highlighted in mitigating climate change. And what you can see here is the projected growth in carbon dioxide emission after uh, 2017. And what you can see is the triangle that is how carbon dioxide emission are going to look like depending on different mitigation scenario that we might take. And we can see that if we allow the rate of carbon dioxide emission identical to the period rate until the carbon dioxide emission reached uh, 60 gigaton carbon dioxide by year 2050, the global temperature would increase to uh, 6 degrees C above uh, pre-industrial level. But if we can reduce uh, the rate of carbon dioxide emission to be lower than 20 gigaton carbon dioxide by year 2050, uh, the global temperature would be no more than 2 degrees C. And that is the target of 2 degree scenario. And in order to achieve 2 degree scenario, we have uh, to take a serious action from now. Uh, otherwise, we will uh, face irreversible climate change. So how can we mitigate the carbon dioxide emission? Actually, we have different technology 
that contribute to sequestration of carbon dioxide uh, via uh, CCS carbon capture and storage and CCU carbon capture and utilization and EOR. Uh, EOR stands for enhanced oil recovery. And what you can see is the prediction from 2017 to 2050 that the carbon capture and storage technology, the red line here, uh, provide the maximum reduction of carbon dioxide emission, about 8 gigaton carbon dioxide by year 2050. And the enhanced oil recovery contribute about 6 gigaton carbon dioxide by year 2050. Uh, and we can see a very low carbon dioxide reduction obtained from uh, CCU technology, the green line here. And looking at the table, uh, we can see the current chemical that can be produced from uh, carbon dioxide, such as urea, methanol, and carbonate. And we also see that the amount of chemicals produced from carbon dioxide are relatively low compared to the amount of carbon dioxide that we have to reduce. And that is the reason why the CCU technology make a little contribution to carbon dioxide reduction. And this chart show the petrochemical sector, which consists of four consecutive stages, including feedstock preparation, upstream chemical, intermediate, and downstream chemical. And the downstream chemicals are used to produce many consumer products, such as packaging, uh, automotive, and electronic parts, which are necessary for our everyday life. And we also see that uh, the, consum the consumer product here uh, rely on oil, natural gas, and coal. So if we can replace the raw material derived from fossil fuel by carbon dioxide and using hydrogen produced from uh, renewable energy, we cannot only reduce the carbon dioxide emission from fossil fuel consumption, but also enhance carbon capture utilization technology. And when you looking at the demand of chemical, this is the demand of the most chemical use that is the ethylene, uh, followed by propylene, methanol, uh, benzene, and paracylene. And you can see that the total demand of those chemicals is about 800 million metaton by year 2024. So if those chemicals could be produced from carbon dioxide, it will make a significant contribution to uh, mitigate carbon dioxide emission. And my talk today is focusing on the selective carbon dioxide hydrogenation to lyophilin, including ethylene, propylene, and butylene. Lyophilin can be produced from uh, carbon dioxide via two different pathways. The first pathway is the modified phytotope synthesis reaction. In this pathway, carbon dioxide is converted to carbon monoxide via reward water gas ship reaction, and then the produced carbon monoxide is hydrogenated to form a various type of hydrocarbon, including lyophilin. And another way is methanol mediated reaction. In this pathway, carbon dioxide is hydrogenated to form methanol, which can be further transformed into uh, lyophilin via methanol to olefin pro uh, uh, process over an acid catalyst. And this slide show compare uh, the comparison of uh, carbon dioxide conversion C2 to C4 olefin uh, selectivity and lyophilin yield obtained from different pathway report in literature. And looking to the left figure first, is this a part of C2 to C4 olefin selectivity at a function of carbon dioxide conversion? Uh, over different catalysts performed via physical pathway, the blue color, and oxygenate pathway, the red color. And we can see that the physical pathway provide a higher carbon dioxide conversion, but lower uh, C2 to C4 selectivity. And this is because the carbon dioxide conversion via physical pathway use uh, carbon monoxide as intermediate derived from reward water gas ship reaction. 
and this kind of reaction is endothermic reaction. So the reaction rate and the equilibrium carbon dioxide conversion are going into the same direction. That is the increase of reaction temperature drive both kinetic rate and the carbon dioxide conversion. That means uh, we will have a large volume of carbon monoxide for further conversion to hydrocarbon so that we can obtain a high total carbon dioxide conversion. And for oxygenate pathway, the intermediate is methanol from via CO2 hydrogenation to methanol. And this is an exothermic reaction. And this means that the thermodynamics and kinetic rate are not going into the same direction. And uh, the small amount of uh, methanol can be obtained under realistic condition. Therefore, the, the light olefin yield from the oxygenate pathway is quite low due to the low uh, carbon dioxide conversion to methanol. And we can see from the light figure here that the light olefin yield via fichetol pathway is greatly higher than that of the oxygenate pathway. So is this of great interest if we can increase the selectivity uh, toward light olefin via fichetol pathway? And for the fichetol pathway, we need bifunctional catalysts that are active for both reward water gas ship reaction and fichetol synthesis reaction. And some of you guys might know that the iron and cobalt are active for both reaction. However, in comparison between iron and cobalt, cobalt has higher hydrogenation ability, which could uh, lead the formation of uh, methane and paraffin product and which are uh, not our desired product. So we start with iron as the main component in our catalyst. And this slide shows the carbon dioxide conversion, olefin to paraffin ratio and diolefin yield over iron alumina and iron alumina modified with a small amount of cobalt. And looking to the iron alumina catalyst first, we can see that the catalyst was quite active for the carbon dioxide hydrogenation as it provides the carbon dioxide conversion allow 40%. Um, however, the hydrocarbon product were mainly paraffin and it can give only 2% light olefin yield. And when we add a small amount of cobalt on iron alumina catalyst, we found a remarkable increase in carbon dioxide conversion around uh, 20%, but there is no any improvement on the generation of light olefin product. And this slide shows the effects of potassium addition on iron alumina catalyst and iron cobalt alumina catalyst. Looking to the iron potassium alu alumina catalyst, uh, the top row first, uh, we can see that the carbon dioxide conversion slightly dropped after potassium addition, but the olefin to paraffin ratio was greatly improved and the light olefin yield was increased from 2% to 11%. And the similar thing was also observed when potassium was added into bimetallic iron cobalt alumina catalyst and the olefin to paraffin ratio over the potassium uh, promote bimetallic was allowed 6 with a uh, slightly drop compared to the potassium promote monometallic iron catalyst. However, the uh, potassium promote bimetallic achieved the higher light olefin yield due to uh, uh, a higher carbon dioxide conversion. And we try to characterize our catalyst at different stages to discord the structure activity relationship and this slide shows the phase of iron species evolution during the reduction of catalyst with hydrogen at different temperature examined by same technique. And we have two different catalysts that are potassium free catalyst, the top picture, and the potassium promote catalyst, the bottom picture. And we can see that the eight position of both catalysts uh, chip toward lower energy with increasing reduction temperature, indicating the decrease of oxidation state of iron species. 
and for more clearly, we perform linear combination fitting to calculate the fraction of iron species during the reduction. And the result is shown here. We can see that both catalysts consist of hematite or Fe2O3 after the reduction at 200 degrees Celsius. And with increasing the reduction temperature, the hematite of both catalysts was gradually uh, transformed into magnetite, FeO, and metallic iron. And after prolonged the reduction period to five hours, the potassium promote catalyst show a larger fraction of metallic iron, about uh, 30%. Compared to 17.5% uh, of uh, potassium free catalyst. And this slide shows the XRD pattern of spent potassium free and potassium promote catalyst. We can see that the iron carbide uh, in the form of uh, Fe5C2 was formed only for the potassium promote catalyst, while the Fe3O4 or magnetite phase was uh, predominantly present for the potassium-free catalyst. So we can conclude that the presence of uh, potassium enhanced further transformation of uh, magnetite to iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2. Uh, we examine the strength of uh, carbon dioxide with the catalyst uh, surface using a uh, CO2 TBD technique. And we can see that the potassium free catalyst show only one broad desorption peak allow 120 degrees C. And with the potassium addition, the desorption of carbon dioxide uh, at 500 degrees C was found. And this indicated that the presence of potassium facilitated the absorption of carbon on the catalyst surface which could be related to the formation of iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2. And we also examine the strain of hydrogen with the catalyst surface. And we can see that the potassium-free catalyst show a broad desorption peak ranging from 100 to 500 degrees C. And after potassium addition, the weak hydrogen absorption in the range of 100 to 200 degrees C disappear, suggesting that the uh, addition of potassium eliminate the weak hydrogen absorption. And we also investigate the nature of carbon dioxide absorbed on the catalyst surface with a uh, diffuse refractant infrared Fourier transform. And as you can see, the surface of potassium free catalyst after exposed to carbon dioxide show the presence of bicarbonate species, the red line here. And however, this species disappear after the sample was heated at 200 degrees C, indicating weak bonding of bicarbonate species on the catalyst surface. And after modification of iron cobalt with potassium, uh, we can see the bidentate and monodentate species or the catalyst surface in addition to the bicarbonate species. And when the sample was heated at higher than uh, 100 degrees uh, degree C, the bicarbonate species disappear, similar to the uh, potassium-free catalyst. However, the absorption bands of bidentate and monodentate species were still visible, indicating that these species are more stable than the bicarbonate species. So uh, we come to the conclusion how the addition of potassium enhance the light olefin production. And looking at to the uh, top picture, this is a potassium free catalyst. And this catalyst provides a low uh, surface coverage of carbon, resulting in a low carbon carbon chain growth. And in addition, this catalyst contain a large fraction of weak hydrogen absorption, which uh, promote the hydrogenation reaction, resulting in the high paraffin product. And for the potassium promote catalyst, the bottom picture, the interaction uh, of carbon dioxide with the catalyst surface was improved, uh, which 
favors uh, iron carbide formation and leading to the high density of active site for carbon carbon coupling. And in addition, the potassium promote catalyst eliminate the surface coverage of weakly adsorbed hydrogen, which retard the hydrogenation ability of the surface carbon species and therefore favoring the formation of olefin. And now uh, we change the support from alumina to carbon and we study the effects of pore structure, including uh, micropolar only and micromesopolar carbon. And as you can see in the table, the base surface area of micropolar carbon only was uh, very high, about 1,700 square meter per gram. Uh, and the base surface area of micropolar mesopolar carbon was two times lower than uh, the base surface area of uh, micropolar carbon only. And after impregnation of both carbon support uh, with iron, cobalt, and potassium, their base surface area uh, were drastically dropped. And this slide shows the same image of a uh, different catalyst. And looking to the unsupported catalyst, the red figure here, we can see an aggregate of large metal oxide particle size. And we can see that the particle size will reduce when metal was loaded on micropolar mesopolar carbon, the middle figure. And the particle size become even smaller when uh, loaded on micropolar carbon only because it has the largest base surface area. And this slide shows the effects of pore structure of carbon support on the carbon dioxide hydrogenation to light olefin. And as we can see, the iron cobalt potassium uh, supported on micropolar carbon only give uh, the higher carbon dioxide conversion uh, compared to the other catalyst. And this could be attributed to the high dispersion of uh, metal observed by the image. However, products was uh, mainly methane with low olefin to paraffin ratio and low light olefin yield. And we can see that the micropolar mesopolar carbon catalyst provide a lower carbon dioxide conversion, but the olefin to paraffin ratio and light olefin yield were higher with a uh, lower amount of methane. And we use XRD techniques to investigate the phase of reduce and spend catalyst. And looking to the left figure first, this is a XRD pattern uh, of the reduce catalyst. And we can see that uh, the iron species of both micropolar and micromesopolar catalyst were mostly converted to metallic uh, iron after reduction. And looking to the right figure, this is the XRD pattern of the spin catalyst. And we can see that the iron species in the micropolar carbon is uh, mainly magnetized Fe3O4 with a small fraction of iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2. However, for the uh, micromesopolar carbon catalyst, the I the iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2 become more dominant with a fraction, uh, with, uh, with a reduction of uh, magnetite phase. And the larger fraction of magnetite phase over the micropolar catalyst could be attributed to the large surface area that provide the excessive dispersion of particle resulting in a low interfacial contact of iron and uh, potassium particle, and therefore um, the small amount of iron carbide fate could be formed. And so that is the reason why the micropolar carbon catalyst give a low uh, olefin product. And we also study the effects of reducing gas, including, including hydrogen only, and a gas mixture containing hydrogen and carbon dioxide in the ratio of T to 1. And looking to the light figure, we can see that the iron species was uh, predominantly present in the form of metallic iron 
after the reduction with hydrogen only. And when we switch from hydrogen only to hydrogen and carbon dioxide, the metallic ion was not observed, and the magnetite and iron carbide in the form of Fe3C was found instead. And this slide shows the light origin yield over the catalyst reduced with hydrogen only, the red line here, and the catalyst reduced with carbon dioxide and hydrogen, the blue color here. And we can see that the catalyst reduced with hydrogen only was more active for light olefin production. And we examine the fate of iron species of both uh, spent catalysts. And we can see that the iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2 was formed only for the catalyst reduced with hydrogen. And the catalyst reduced with carbon dioxide and hydrogen show the iron carbide in the form of Fe3C. And looking to the light figure, the catalyst with uh, reduced with hydrogen only, uh, the red right here, show the decomposition of iron carbide at lower temperature compared to the uh, decomposition of iron carbide over the catalyst reduced with uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And this result suggests that the iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2 was more active than iron carbide in the form of Fe3C. So as to uh, summarize, single metal iron alumina catalyst was found to be active for uh, carbon dioxide hydrogenation, but not selective for the formation of light olefin. And the addition of cobalt into iron alumina catalyst enhance the carbon dioxide conversion, but there was no any improvement on the formation of light olefin. And adding potassium onto iron alumina remarkably enhanced the light olefin formation. And adding potassium strengthened the interaction of hydrogen and carbon dioxide with the catalyst surface. And the intimate contact of potassium species and iron species was essential to stabilize the iron carbide species. And this is the key structure for the light olefin formation from carbon dioxide hydrogenation. And the reduction of iron-based catalyst with hydrogen only convert the hematite to metallic iron with a small fraction of magnetite. And this phase uh, was further transformed to iron carbide in the form of Fe5C2 during the CO2 hydrogenation. And switching the hydrogen gas only to a gas mixture containing hydrogen and carbon dioxide led to the formation of magnetite and iron carbide in the form of Fe3C. And the iron carbide in the form of Fe3C was less active than Fe5C2 for the light olefin production due to, uh, due to too strong interaction of iron and carbon. And I would like to thank financial support from this organization. And I also like to thank my colleagues for their kind support. And before I finish my talk, I like to thank, I like to take this opportunity to thank my students who work uh, very hard with me. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for your very nice and informative talk. Do we have one short question from the, the panel? Okay. My question is about quite long. <laughs> may you try may you try to answer my, one of my questions. Uh, based on the strategy move strategic movements on net zero emissions. Do you think which catalyst and carbon dioxide conversion pathway or hydrocarbon product will be uh, good for the future perspective? Um, yes, uh, because as you can see in the previous slide, I show that uh, three way to mitigate carbon dioxide emission. That is the carbon capture and storage. Uh, enhance oil recovery and uh, carbon capture and utilization. 
And if 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 you see the demand of the uh, chemical use uh, for our everyday lives, uh, the ethylene is the most chemical used. And when we, when the ethylene convert to the consumer product, it will not decompose to uh, carbon, dioxide, carbon dioxide again. So that that means we can fix uh, the carbon dioxide in the form of a solid product. And the volume of uh, ethylene is quite high. So I, I think this is a is this is a very interesting to convert uh, CO2 to uh, ethylene and we will make a significant contribution to the carbon dioxide reduction. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, no answer. Question. I have one question. Okay. Can I? Oh, yeah. Just, just yeah. one short question. So you show that there are two main pathways for, for like olefin production, like feature tropes and pathway and, and the, the oxy, oxy hydrocarbon, the added pathways. So, 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 presently, so which pathway should be the, the, you know, that a good choice to go? Mm, um, I think we, we, we have to, um, see the overview of all, uh, te technical, uh, economic study because, uh, both pathway use different equipment uh, for the uh, generation of light olefin. I think it, it depends on the unit unit operation and and the reactor and operating uh, condition used uh, to produce carbon dioxide uh, to to convert carbon dioxide to light olefin. We we need to calculate the energy balance and uh, uh, cost for the equipment used for its its process. And this is uh, under my investigation. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Should we have uh, 10 minutes or five minutes for, to, to break the session before starting again? Yes, I think uh, Dr. Supavadi, you, can you um, we actually um we already late but um we, we can take a break, break for five minutes yeah let's <laughs> take a break, break. Okay. <laughs> for the chairman <laughs> to take a break okay thank you very much okay. yeah so we back um uh, at uh 2 45 it's okay okay thank you so um, during the break, I also <laughs> again would like to ask everyone to um, do the assess assessment for us on um, the screen um, for a moment. Yes, you can see on the right hand side of the screen and um, please fill in the form for us in um, case you haven't done that. Thank you. ไทยนาภัยจากการเปลี่ยนแปลงของสภาพอากาศอันเนื่องมาจากก๊าซเรือนกระจกได้ส่งผลวิกฤตร้ายแรงไปทั่วโลกทั้งโรคระบาดไฟป่าคลื่นความร้อนไม่เว้นแม้แต่ประเทศไทยที่ต้องเผชิญกับมหันตภัยทางธรรมชาติที่มีความถี่และทวีความรุนแรงมากขึ้นเสมือนโลกส่งสัญญาณเตือนครั้งสุดท้ายให้ทุกประเทศหันมาตระหนักถึงการลดปริมาณก๊าซเรือนกระจกอย่างจริงจังกลุ่มวิจัยการเร่งปฏิกิริยาและการคำนวณระดับนาโนนาโนเทคสวทชได้มุ่งวิจัยเทคโนโลยีการดักจับและใช้ประโยชน์คาร์บอนซึ่งไม่เพียงช่วยลดการปลดปล่อยคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์สู่ชั้นบรรยากาศแต่ยังนำมาใช้เปลี่ยนเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ที่มีมูลค่าสูงทางเศรษฐกิจทีมวิจัยของเรานะคะทีมวิจัย n c a s มีเป้าหมายในการที่จะพัฒนาเทคโนโลยีเพื่อความยั่งยืนทางพลังงานและก็สิ่งแวดล้อมค่ะผ่านการใช้ตัวเร่งปริยาเคมีวัสดุนาโนแล้วก็กระบวนการทางเคมีใหม่ๆนะคะในการที่จะเปลี่ยนของเหลือใช้จากภาคการเกษตรและอุตสาหกรรมค่ะให้กลายเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์มากมูลค่าค่ะ
ซึ่งจุดเด่นของทีมวิจัยของเรานะคะก็คือเราทํางานแต่ต้นน้ําไล่ไปจนถึงปลายน้ําเลยค่ะต้นน้ำเนี่ยเราก็ศึกษาองค์ความรู้เชิงลึกนะคะซึ่งจะเป็นรากฐานของนวัตกรรมในอนาคตส่วนปลายน้ำเนี่ยก็คือเราทํางานกับเอกชนเพื่อที่ว่าเราจะได้สเกลอัพเทคโนโลยีของเรานะคะจาก lab scale ไปสู่ pilot scale ค่ะเทคโนโลยีที่เราจะไฮไลท์ในวันนี้นะคะก็คือเทคโนโลยีการดักจับและใช้ประโยชน์ของคาร์บอนค่ะหรือคาร์บอนแคปเจอร์แอนด์ยูทิลิเซชันย่อสั้นๆว่า CCU นะคะ CCU เนี่ยเราเชื่ออย่างยิ่งว่าเป็นทางออกของการจัดการก๊าซเรือนกระจกของภาคอุตสาหกรรมไทยค่ะเพราะว่า CCU เนี่ยประกอบไปด้วย2อย่างนะคะอย่างแรกก็คือการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ก่อนที่จะถูกปล่อยไปในชั้นบรรยากาศและอย่างที่2ก็คือเอาก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ที่ดักจับมาได้เนี่ยค่ะนำมาเปลี่ยนเป็นสารเคมีหรือผลิตภัณฑ์ที่มูลค่าค่ะไอเดียของเทคโนโลยีนะคะก็คือเราสามารถนํากําไรที่ได้จากการขายผลิตภัณฑ์เหล่านี้ค่ะเป็นแรงจูงใจทางเศรษฐกิจให้เอกชนนําเทคโนโลยีนี้ไปใช้ได้จริงๆในอุตสาหกรรมค่ะงานวิจัยของทีม NCAS ของพวกเรานะคะก็ครอบคลุมกันตั้งแต่อาการพัฒนาวัสดุดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ค่ะโดยเฉพาะวัสดุกลุ่มคาร์บอนนะคะแล้วก็ Metal Organic Frameworks ค่ะซึ่งวัสดุเหล่านี้มีเป็นวัสดุที่มีรูปุนสูงนะคะแล้วเราสามารถขยายกําลังการผลิตได้ง่ายเราสามารถปรับปรุงคุณสมบัติของวัสดุเหล่านี้ให้ดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์ได้อย่างมีประสิทธิภาพซึ่งเราตั้งเป้าหมายไว้2ระ,ระยะนะคะระยะแรกก็คือการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์จากอุตสาหกรรมโดยตรงนะคะขั้นที่2ในระยะไกลกว่าก็คือการดักจับก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์จากอากาศเลยทีเดียวค่ะแล้วก็นอกจากการดักจับแก๊สคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์นะคะเราก็ยังสนใจกระบวนการเปลี่ยนก๊สคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์เป็นสารเคมีด้วยค่ะซึ่งเราแบ่งเป้าเทคโนโลยีไว้เป็น3ระยะด้วยกันค่ะระยะแรกนะคะก็คือระยะใกล้กว่าเราจะใช้ความร้อนในการเปลี่ยนก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์นะคะเป็นอาสาตั้งต้นในอุตสาหกรรมปิโตรเคมีค่ะประกอบไปด้วยอ่าโปรดักต์สกลุ่มนะคะกลุ่มแรกก็คือกลุ่มซินแก๊สค่ะซึ่งเป็นสารผสมระหว่างคาร์บอนมอนอกไซด์แล้วก็ไฮโดรเจนค่ะผลิตได้จากการทําปฏิกิริยาระหว่างแก๊สคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์กับมีเทนกลุ่มที่2นะคะกลุ่มเมทานอลค่ะเมทานอลเนี่ยผลิตได้จากการทําปฏิกิริยาระหว่างก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์กับไฮโดรเจนค่ะส่วนเป้าหมายระยะกลางนะคะคือการใช้ไฟฟ้าในการเปลี่ยนก๊าซคาร์บอนไดออกไซด์เป็นสารเคมีโดยเฉพาะจําพวกกลุ่มเอทเทลีนแล้วก็เอทานอลค่ะซึ่งเป็นสารตั้งต้นของพลาสติกแล้วก็เคมีพันธุ์ของประเทศที่สําคัญมากๆนะคะเทคโนโลยีนี้มีข้อดีมากๆก็คือทํางานได้ที่อุณหภูมิต่ำความดันต่ำนะคะแล้วก็เชื่อมโยงกับพลังงานทางเลือกได้ในทันทีอย่างไร้รอยต่อค่ะเราเลยชื่อว่าเป็นเทคโนโลยีแห่งอนาคตนะคะแล้วขั้นตอนสุดท้ายระยะไกลนะคะก็คือเราจะใช้แสงอาทิตย์เนี่ยแหละค่ะในการเปลี่ยนแก๊ส CO2 เนี่ยค่ะให้กลายเป็นผลิตภัณฑ์ทางเคมีค่ะซึ่งกระบวนการเนี่ยมีลักษณะใกล้เคียงกันเลยกับการสั่งข้อแสงของพืชค่ะใช้เพียงแค่ก๊าซ CO2 นะคะ,ะน้ำแล้วก็แสงอาทิตย์ค่ะเราก็เลยเรียกเทคโนโลยีนี้นะคะว่าเทคโนโลยีการสังเคราะห์แสงประดิษฐ์ค่ะซึ่งจะมีประสิทธิภาพมากกว่าการสังเคราะห์แสงของพืชเป็นสิบเท่าเลยค่ะเราเชื่อว่าเป็นเทคโนโลยีสะอาดแห่งอนาคตอย่างแท้จริงค่ะเทคโนโลยีการดักจับแล้วก็ใช้ประโยชน์ของคาร์บอนหรือ CCU นะคะจะมีส่วนช่วยในการขับเคลื่อนโมเดลเศรษฐกิจ BCG อย่างแน่นอนค่ะเพราะว่านอกจากเราจะช่วยลดก๊าซเรือนกระจกแล้วนะคะเรายังสามารถนําก๊าซเรือนกระจกนั้นมาเปลี่ยนเป็นสารเคมีมากมูลค่าซึ่งจะตอบโจทย์ความต้องการของอุตสาหกรรมหนักอย่างแน่นอนถึงแม้ว่าเทคโนโลยีนี้ค่ะจะเป็นที่สนใจของประชาคมโลกนะคะทั้งในแล้วก็ต่างประเทศแต่ว่าก็ยังมีมีวินนิ่งโซลูชันเลยค่ะเราเชื่ออย่างยิ่งนะคะว่าการพัฒนาเทคโนโลยี CCU ในประเทศด้วยคนไทยเป็นศิลปะของคนไทยเพื่อบริบทของอุตสาหกรรมไทยอะคะ่ะจะแก้ปัญหาก๊าซเรือนกระจกของประเทศไทยเพื่อให้ประเทศของเรานะคะถึงหมุดหมายการเป็นกลางทางคาร์บอนภายในปี2050อย่างแน่นอนคะ่ะท่านใดสนใจงานวิจัยของพวกเราชาว n c a s นะคะสามารถเยี่ยมชมได้นะคะจากที่เว็บไซต์ก่อนหรือว่าไปที่ Facebook Page เลยก็ได้นะคะแต่ถ้ายังไม่เพียงพอนะคะสามารถตบเท้าเข้ามาเยี่ยมชมพวกเราได้ที่ศูนย์นาโนเทคโนโลยีแห่งชาติได้เลยค่ะพวกเรามีงานวิจัยรักโลกเจ๋งๆมากมายนะคะที่ตอบโจทย์ BCG ของประเทศหรือว่าถ้าเอกชนท่านไหนนะคะอยากได้
He also has key roles in decarbonization, especially in driving and deploying carbon dioxide reduction, hydrogen and advanced recycling technologies for programs with net zero emission as a main target. Today's his talks will be decarbonizing petrochemical industry and loads of carbon capture and utilization. Station technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Welcome Dr. Butra. Can you hear me all right? A, a bit quite. Uh, may you increase the, the voice? Yeah. Hang on, let me try. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to hold the mic near, near to my face. And uh, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for the very nice introduction and, and the invitation to talk in the in a very good conference so far. So uh, let me share the, the my screen. Uh, please let me know if you, if you can see it now. It's fine now. It's okay. All right. Okay. So uh, as uh, Dr. Meit uh, introduced, I'm, I'm, I work at SEG Chemicals for the last uh, 15 years. And uh, my role res and responsibility now is the, to deploy the right technology at the right time, uh, especially on the decarbonizing uh, our, our industry within Thailand and the regional footprint. So first of all, I, I'd like to give you a, a an overview of the CO2 emission from the industry uh, sector. So uh, globally, there's a equivalent of 50 gigatons of CO2 emission uh, being emitted to the environment uh, annually. And uh, chemicals and petrochemicals contribute around 3% of that, which uh, equates to around 1.5 gigatons per year. And uh, luckily, SEG, uh, SEG Group has three of the most, uh, you know, uh, CO2 intensive uh, industry in the industrial sector. So we, we, it's our responsibility to reduce that, and we already announced our, our, our goal in 2013-2015. Uh, let's look at the, at the bottom half of the slide. At the moment, uh, you know, uh, we all know that uh, CO2 has a price. CO2 now has a price, so we don't see it in the, in the Thai market at the moment. But uh, in the, especially in the European Union, the ETS price is already now reached 100. It, it was uh, $80 per ton back in November 2021, but at the moment, I think it's already reached 100. And some of the countries, uh, apart from using ETS as a mechanism for the reaction, they also impose a carbon tax as high as 170 US dollars by 2030. Uh, especially in uh, a country like Netherlands and Canada, which you know they they really want to drive the the uh, the the carbon reduction towards net zero. So all all I'm saying is you know uh, from now on you know from 2022 onwards, uh, carbon has a price, and Thailand will announce a carbon tax in the very near future. So uh, we will be experiencing the penalties from carbon very very soon. So I've touched on uh, 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 my company, you know, SEG has pledged net zero by 2050. And SEG Chemicals, uh, because we are very intensive in, in carbon, in, in power generation, uh, sorry, power consumption, uh, SEG Chemical will probably announce a carbon neutral by 2050 rather than net zero. But, you know, I, I think it, it's, it's uh, well aligned together. And, uh, and various, uh, we, we probably have seen in the news that we are pushing out a lot of efforts to go towards net zero, especially with, you know, green chem green polymer that we are launching, and also the uh, uh, my boss there in the, in the middle, uh, my ex uh, boss, who what is a found you know founding member of Alliance for Plastic Waste. So circular economy and then CO two would be our primary goal for the next uh, ten years. Let Let's also go over some some jargon. So uh, CO two, you know, from from the 1.5 gigatons from from petrochemical industry. If you actually look at east side of a petro petrochemical site, it produced around 1.5 to 2 uh, million tons of CO2 from direct emission and scope two. So basically, uh, the CO2 is divided into three scope. You know, the 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 first scope, scope one, 
it's a direct emission, basically all the combustion, all the company facilities and the company vehicle who are uh, basically burning uh, natural gas or coal or oil uh, to, to get the process heat and, and internal uh, functions of the company. Scope 2 mean uh, any uh, power that, that's purchased, especially uh, in the form of electricity. And scope three are uh, every other thing. So, you know, scope three includes uh, the feed stocks and the business travel uh, distribution, and basically how we get the product to customers and to the end of life product. So, when you look at the petrochemical complex, a typical petrochemical complex, so the feed comes in from the left, and the middle bit is the petrochemical plant and direct to customers. So, we have a very, very, very big scope three, which is the feed that comes from the fossil fuel base. Uh, somewhat large scope two that comes from power. So each, uh, let's say, you know, in Thailand, uh, each complex consume around 100, uh, 100 megawatts of, of power. And everything that comes into the boundary is considered scope one. So basically, you know, the, the heating that goes into the furnace, the heating that goes into the, uh, basically, uh, the column uh, in terms of the heat that's generated to, to make steam will consider scope one. And everything that goes out from our, from our uh, basically a, a battery limit, a boundary that goes to customers considered scope three. So when you say net zero, this one plus two plus three, but if you look at carbon neutral, largely scope one and two from from here. So so it it, it also the the jargons also varies from place to place, and 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 and, and each company will commit to different things. But this is a a typical. Uh, a petrochemical and, and how it looks like in terms of CO2 emission. So uh, b before we go to this page, uh, if you look at any petrochemical complexes or petrochemical company or any, any other company to, for the matter of fact, uh, there are five ways that everybody's saying uh, that, that we can include uh, uh, reduce carbon dioxide. The first one is to use uh, is optimization. Basically, we look at the 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 existing complex and ask ourselves, how do we optimize everything? So we will be deploying digitalization. So basically industry 4.1 in, in, and also uh, in uh, hand in hand with how do we do the energy transition from, you know, a, a, a common electricity and how do we move it to renewable energy? So the, these are, this happens everywhere, including other industries as well. So th this goes, goes a long way with uh, you know, basically, uh, it, it is a low hanging fruit for 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 everyone in industry. The second way is uh, circular economy. Basically, we reduce our footprint in the 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 product and the feedstock as efficient as possible. So basically, uh, SEG or every, everybody else in the petrochemical world will do these things. So basically, we do uh, uh, mechanical recycling. So you've seen that in the in a product that that goes back to the shelf, and comes up in form of the you know shampoo bottles and 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 package and uh, various other packaging. The second is that where is chemical is recycling is chemical recycling. So we take feed and go straight back to the to the source. And uh, I'm sorry for the for the alarm bell behind me, but you know it will go away very soon. So the second uh, approach for recycling is we do chemical recycling. So we take the the you know product necessary in in use, and then, uh, and basically uh, do chemical treatment and go and it, it, the feedstock goes back to petrochemical and comes back as a uh, you know an, as as uh, nearly as neat of a polymer as possible. And uh, you know we, if if you're interested, please look up. These uh, these organization called Alliance for Plastic Waste. So it is a uh, you know a a almost like a foundation uh, a foundation. So it is a a you know non benefit uh, organization that drive these circularities to end the plastic waste that goes into the environment around the world, which is a you know very good uh, organization to work with. The third approach is hydrogen. So I, I you know hydrogen is a very, very simple uh, molecules, but very, very complex in terms of production and how it is branded and how we calculate the type of hydrogen. So the, my, my notes on the left is, you know, hydrogen is color is colorless, but yet very, very colorful. And the costs are very, very different. 
So in the market now, uh, this is just a handful of color that, that's being branded to hydrogen. So the most common hydrogen in the market is gray hydrogen. So this is produced as a byproduct from petrochemical complex. It's produced in uh, you know, refineries and, and it's very, very high in CO2 emission. On the other hand, as you know, well, everybody has seen that green hydrogen is an upcoming uh, trend. So it is from renewable energy and go electrolysis and 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 produce hydrogen that's almost uh, free of of CO two. So you know, actually, it's, it, if you look at uh, carefully at the LCA, it's not zero, but it is regarded as as zero at the moment. So uh, I think a lot of people are still uh, looking at uh, in terms of calculation of carbon intensity very well. Uh, better than this. In the middle, there are various other colors. You know, there's a turquoise hydrogen, there's blue hydrogen, there's pink hydrogen. So, to, uh, let, let's look at blue hydrogen first. Blue hydrogen is very similar. It, it, it is the same as gray hydrogen on, on, in, on the bottom here, but it is coupled with CCS. So, it is well aligned with our with this uh, uh, con consortium with this conference. That you know, actually, CCS is also play a very important role in the hydrogen world as well. Uh, if you look at it, the other color, is turquoise. It's somewhere kind of between green and blue. So it is similar. It is used a fossil fee as a feedstock. It's fossil fuel as feedstock, which is natural natural gas. And then rather than going through a reforming process, it go to pyrolysis process, and it produce to hydrogen and carbon black. So this is this technology is is very very interesting in terms of uh, industrial deployment because uh, because now we have two usable products so in, in terms of economic it, might, it should be better than than you know, going straight to blue hydrogen but you know this is this is the other approach that all the petrochemical uh, company in the world are looking at the fourth one is the electrification of high temperature units so. Uh, if you guys are from petrochemical world, uh, we 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 operate nafta cracker, which is basically a, a, an oven that goes up to a thousand degrees. So it, it is actually you know th this is almost like a kitchen. So you change from the uh, uh, natural gas oven to electric oven basically, and there are a few groups around the world who who are pursuing this. You know the first one is. Uh, an organization that calls himself a cracker of the future, and these are the, mem the the members that in there, and they are working with a very interesting technologies to turn uh, you know the, these high temperature unit into a, a motorized unit, and uh, the other two uh, consortiums are Dow Shell TNO and S ISPT in Netherlands, and they are sponsored by the uh, World Economic Forum to to pursue this, and the other group. Which is BSF, Sabic, and Linde are also pursuing this in 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 Netherlands as well. So it is very interesting to see who comes out in terms of the the winning. There might not be a clear winner. There might be a you know a combination of of uh, license like licensing opportunities in the, these people. And the last one is uh, CO two uh, capture utility and storage. So you know, I'm I'm going to go through this this, this page very quickly. So you know, there you know, we 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 listen to this all day that you know, uh, there are two ways to deal with CO two. One is to store it in the ground and deal with utilization. So let let's go to the next page, uh, to say that you know what what are the roles that that CCUS can play in the industry, and uh, I think this is the picture that that is very nice to under very easy to understand that that's produced by Alberta Carbon Hub. And uh, Alberta, it's a very it's a state in Canada that is that is really really you know uh, saying out loud that they will rely on a CCS and CCU in the next uh, 10, 20 years because you know there are big opportunities there and and Alberta is one of the uh, states in the Canada is that will introduce a very very he heavy penalized penalties on CO two emission. So if you look at Again, in the naphtha cracker, cracker, which is you know the, basically the, the 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 baseline for petrochemical world, in order to decarbonize a cracker, there are very various different ways to do it. You know, we will touch on the first one with optimization, which is doing within the house. The second one is uh, you know that we touch on uh, the circular economy, so it comes in as a renewable feed and re re renewable raw material. The third one is hydrogen. So hydrogen is everywhere. Hydrogen can goes to as a feed, 
you know, can go to uh, reaction with CCUs and, and various other things. But I, I think the, 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 the critical one is still uh, CCS because CCS can, it, it gives us an option of, you know, capturing directly from our stack of flu stack and capture it and send it to the infrastructure, or it can be coupled with uh, blue hydrogen. So the hydrogen as produced with, uh, you know, a, a normal reforming can, the CO2 can be captured and hydrogen can be low in carbon that can be used within the infrastructure. And also it also plays the other role is, you know, if you have a capture unit already, it also give us an option to go forward into the utilization phase in the future. So, as I said, the, the two main roles, you know, the, so CO2 capture utilization can, can act as a, as a direct sink for CO2 to enable, you know, the, the, the existing facilities and the hydrogen economy. Or it can be used at the. Uh, it can be, again play a role as to you know to uh, use CO two as a feedstock. And uh, so let let me touch on the the CCS first, which is the the storage. So if 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 you have free time, please have a look at the the report that's done by EIA, is the International Energy Agency. They did a survey in uh, two thousand and twenty to twenty one about the the opportunities of storage in Southeast Asia. And we can conclude that in Southeast Asia, there's a big thing around. There's a there's a potentially in Thailand, Vietnam, in Indonesia, and if you include Malay, Malaysia as well, there are lots of places that can can go. In, in total, it can you know, it, it be in a range of 100, 100 gigatons of CO two sink for for Southeast Asia. But the only downside is it's scattered around. You know, it, it it's not concentrated in one area. It's you know somewhere in Thailand. Some is in Vietnam, some is in Malaysia, some is in, in, in Indonesia. So, so it'd be very interesting to see what you know the each countries in Southeast Asia would take in terms of the deployment rate and who do they work with and how each government will play its role in uh, in each uh, projects. But if you look at uh, uh, Thailand, you know the. Uh, it, it, let's say, let's go back to Southeast Asia first. There's a, a lot of in the news over the last two years. A lot of companies is, is saying out loud that they want to do this in Southeast Asia. For example, uh, Petronas, uh, Petamina Indonesia, PDTEP, who will speak later on, BP, Repsol, Shell, and Exxon are planning for CCS unit in in uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, and also Chevron as well. I think Chevron in, in Thailand is playing a major role because you know they they. They do. They do a lot of projects uh, in 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 uh, Gulf of Thailand. And uh, late uh, last year, also, uh, board of investment in Thailand already come out and announced that you know there'll be a tax exemption for uh, petrochemical industry and natural gas separation. You know, if if uh, the industry deploy a CCS and CCU unit, and uh, we we get some some you know early incentive from the government. But uh, for me, it's not merely enough. Uh, to to jumpstart this because uh, we also need uh, a lot of other things to be considered. So, for example, I, I've drafted out uh, you know a, a a just a simple consideration of how CCUS might happen in any places, especially in, in Southeast Asia. First, if if you want to look at the the potential of CCUS, you have to look at the geography and the geology as well. Can CO two be stored? Is it far from the uh, 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 the source? Uh, how big is the capacities? Second consideration is the tax or incentive. Is there is there penalties? You know, uh, are we talking about you know heavy penalized like the EU or in in Canada, or are we talking about you know the five hundred five dollars per ton like Singapore? This is a big uh, kind of uh, consideration whether the project will be feasible or not. The third one is, uh, do is if you want to go into CCU, is there a market for CO two based product? You know, is there a need from the market? Is there really a premium to be gained? And who are the the customer, which might not be near us, might be you know, far far away in 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 the European Union or in Japan. And lastly, is there facilities or infrastructure that's needed? You know, apart from the renewable energy that we need, we also need you know whether there's a you know a, a pipeline. A compressor unit, a you know the 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 rig 
that will inject CO2 into the ground is the infrastructure of hydrogen, is the infrastructure of these, which, you know, how, how can we build a consortium around the facilities as well? Because, you know, I, I, CCUS is not a one-man game that, that, that any company can play. It needs a consortium, including the government unit. So uh, I've put in a kind of example of, of a project which is done in Netherlands, a project called Pothos. It's, it's in Rotterdam. It's linked to a uh, industrial uh, estate in Rotterdam, which is quite big. So let's go through the, the question that, that you know, I posed just now. What about ge geography and geology? You know, uh, is, is, is there potentially big for this project? So we already said that it's 37 million tons of CO2 within 15 year period, which is reasonably big. Uh, to, as I said, you know, uh, if a petrochemical complex emit 1.5 million tons of CO2 per year, so it, it, it can accommodate up to, let's say, 20 uh, complex within, within that, you know, one facility alone. What about tax incentive? You know, I've, I've mentioned that EUTS is already now beyond $100 per ton of CO2. And Netherlands CO2 tax will go over 150000 uh, $150 per ton of CO2. So definitely, that's a that's an incentive to do this. So if you look at the the market or the the, the basically the the price that that to be paid for this project, then there's no market. The CO2 has to be stored. But you know, if you look at the cost position of the of the CCS that a company has to pay, it has to pay you know for the capex and opex, which equates around eighty to hundred dollars per ton of CO2. So if you look compare that to the in, to the penalties that each company we face, it just almost mesh out. But especially in Netherlands, the tax will be more expensive than the cost of the CO2 capture and storage. So that, that's why that's why this project is a go ahead and a lot of the, of the industry will be using the facilities. And lastly, infrastructure, how does it look like? So the government actually uh, invest in compressor station, invest in pipeline, invest in injector platform for for the region. So the industry can only do the capture unit in the in the site, and basically put the gas into the pipeline that the government has provided. That that's why the pro this kind of project happens around around you know uh, there's a couple of more projects in the in the EU as well, and also it looks the same in Canada. It looks the same in Australia. So I'm hoping that you know the Thai government will have a look at this and and do something similar. Let's look at uh, utilization. You know, uh, it, it sounds almost like a CCS is very straightforward. You know, uh, the carbon is captured, it put into the pipe, it goes to the compressor, then it's transported in pipeline and goes to the rig and goes to the ground. So the steps are less complicated, but it it, it is more like a you know uh, you 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 hit you hit a rock with a hammer. Basically, you just use a brute force and in, and large investment to go into uh, CCS. But for CCU, it, 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 it's a different story. It's to me, it's a much more complicated and complex scenarios. The, these are the only uh, kind of a few points that 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 you know make CCU struggle. You know, one, you know, there's very low readiness. You know, everybody is still in development phase. So whether it's fermentation, whether it's catalyst, whether it's you know it's going to building material, is still an early stage. So it needs more time to develop. It is very, very high cost, you know, in terms of capex. You know, we talk about, let's say, you know, if, if the, the 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 previous professor talked about Fisher Trough, and Fisher Trough facility costs, you know, a few hundred million US dollars to do because it is a you know high high temperature, high pressure unit, and also it it it, it also presents a engineering problems on the separation units as well. So we talk about really high cost and high opex because you need a lot of hydrogen so how wh where do we find a low carbon hydrogen which is needed for the kind of reaction it also presents a, a a a question on lifetime because you know different utilizations got different rate different lifetime so whether it goes into methanol which you know almost go directly into fuel or ethanol go to fuel so the lifetime is very very short but if you go into a polymer it's a bit longer your debris material is a bit longer, so it depends on the product itself of how how you know, LCA would look like. But also, 
it presents another problem because these products are largely low values. You know, methanol is only a couple of hundred US dollars per ton. Polymer is, you know, maximum 2,000 US dollars per ton. And building materials even cheaper. So, so it presents a, a unique challenge of how do we deploy a very, very expensive technology to produce a very, very cheap product. So it needs a lot more, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot more development on the regulation side from the government, a lot more on the market development side from the brand owners and also the consumer as well. Because if CO2 is mandated to use as a product, so these product price will go up and the price will be passed on some of the price, some of the costs will be passed on to consumer. Which you know makes uh, you know the, the, it raises the question whether the consumer market is ready for these or not, right? But at the moment, the 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 large the largest use of CO two, as you know, the 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 the, the professors and, and and speakers earlier on has mentioned, which it's enhanced oil recovery, uh, because you know enhanced oil recovery is the only uh, outlet which already pays for CO2. So for example, in Canada, uh, the, 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 the regulation said the, the enhanced oil recovery, which use CO2 will comprise 60% of the cost of the enhanced oil recovery. So let's say if, if the oil is $100 per, per barrel at the moment, they can pay for the CO2 uh, from capture unit at $60 per ton. So that's why enhanced oil recovery is is used because of the that that some government mandates in 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 certain regions, but not not all the uh, oil reserver can can use enhanced oil recovery. So it, it it is it is the biggest use, but it's also limited in terms of the global deployment. But let's zoom in into polymers. Uh, the 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 the, ex, the interesting about polymer CO two to polymer is polymer is a very big market. Especially polyolefin, poly it, it it is the, the the largest market that can take on CO two. Basically, polyethylene alone is already hundred million tons in production. Polypropylene, other tens of million tons of production, and various various other uh, uh, polymers as well. So it, it seems like the polymer are the biggest. It should, will be the biggest outlet for CO two. And this graph is done by Nova Institute that shows you know the various different ways of. Uh, CO2 can be used in, in to make different kind of polymer, but uh, I've just I've just highlighted you know in in three colors in the green in green which is the first wave the blue is a second wave and and yellow is a third wave that what we've seen so far from the industry of how uh, CO2 will come out as a feedstock. So the first wave it's uh, you know it goes to methanol production and polyolefins. So it's remain to be uh, po not polyolefin polyols. And polyols is already currently being turned to polyurethane, and it's, it is done by Covestro, and it, it, the product is already in the market already. But in terms of methanol, it, you know, a lot of companies are doing CO2 to methanol, but it still goes directly to uh, other various chemical or power. So we still remain to be seen whether these methanol will be used in an MTO process and goes, goes back to polyolefin or not. And the other one is uh, the first wave is ethanol, which is done by uh, Lansatec. So it's gas fermentation to ethanol, and ethanol is dehydrated to polyolefin. And Lansatec is working with uh, Total Energy and L'Oreal to do just that. Second wave, which is actually is already in the market, which is the polypropylene carbonate and polyalkyl carbonates, but the market is still very, very small. There are only a couple of people around the world who does this, but you know, they, are, they are now in the scale up stage. So this is very, uh, interesting upcoming polymer that 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 could make an impact, and the third wave is you know a, a drop in basically you know the CO two to Fischer trough and Fischer trough to naphtha and naphtha back to polyolefin. Even though Fischer trough is already established reaction, but you know the current Fischer trough it's geared towards a very very large molecular weight uh, uh, oil or waxes, which is not a feedstock for naphtha. Uh, for naphtha cracker, so Fischer trough that aims into a lower region of carbon a number which is lower than ten are still being developed, and also the the biggest downside of this is hydrogen. It has to be low carbon hydrogen. It has to be blue to the least. So that means that you know even though the technology is developed and it's ready to use, hydrogen is not just there. 
that's why you know I put this in the third wave. But you know, uh, my third wave would be 2035, 2040. So it's not long in the future. So I like to close this with with you know uh, basically a, a PR page for SEG Chemicals as well. So you know, so far we've seen uh, I've gone over five five ways of decarbonizing the industry. Uh, I've gone over the you know carbon capture utilization. So I'm just saying that you know a petrochemical, you know a, a small petrochemical like SEG Chemical that comes from a place called Thailand. You know we're trying to make impact to the to the global industry by doing all various different things and also partner with a lot of people to do uh, to do this. You know go to, go towards a net zero target. And uh, just to note that for for carbon capture utilization, we are working with a partner to to do a pilot plan uh, in the next few years. And uh, so I'm just saying that, you know, you, you, uh, we might announce something this year, which is uh, very exciting to me. So uh, uh, that, that's the end of my presentation. So hopefully I'll give you a clear uh, in approach that we are taking and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that, that you might have. Okay, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Will we have some questions from the floor? Okay, maybe not yet. Let me ask you one, one question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, amongst many approaches you have present from your opinion, uh, which one should be the key strategy to like moving towards carbon neutral societies or net zero emission? Because I think you didn't pay attention at the CCU as a maybe the, the techno economics potential maybe not enough. Is that right? I, I think I think to me that we have to do all these five things to go to yeah. towards uh, net zero. But if you look, if if I rephrase your question, what is a million ton solution? It has to be CCS <laughs> at the moment. So yeah. uh, you know, if you want, if you want to remove one million tons of CO two every year, you know, removing and using is is so difficult. It has to go to CCS first as the first step. So that's why I'm, I'm I'm trying to to say it out loud that the Thai, the Thai government and the Thai uh, policy sector have to look at this and utilize the existing, uh, you know, depleted oil well, depleted salt mine, and, and try to use that as quickly as possible. Because you know, if if we don't do that, you know, I, I don't think we can we can go oh, to net zero, you, you know, or, or to uh, carbon yeah. neutral by 2050. Okay. I, I agree with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation. And we, if you yeah. have the question, someone can put in the chat box. Okay. okay. Let me move to the, the next speakers. The last one from this session. Moment, please. Uh, are Kunalu Chon with us? Okay. Yeah. The last speaker will be Kunalu Chon Pokhawat. Kunalu Chon is the analyst technologies and innovation strategy of PTT explorations and productions, which is the leaders in energy transition. She has interest in carbon dioxide utilization technologies and new business development as a co-founder of PTTEP Carbon Capture Utilization Agency and established multi-industry, multi-industry collaboration in carbon dioxide utilization. She has also received the best presenter, presenter award from PTTEP Annual Technology Technical Forums. And the topics of her talks today will be CCU ecosystem a key to accelerate carbon dioxide capture and utilization development. Please join me welcome Gunali Chon. May you open the, the microphone, please? Oh, hi, um, good afternoon. Um, can you see my slide? Very clear. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, so um, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Narishon Pokawat. I'm from PTTEP, 
And today I'm going to be um, talking about CCU ecosystem and why do I think that it is um, important for us, for Thailand, and how it can help us accelerate um, CCU demonstration uh, um, in Thailand. Let me go to the next slide. So, um, so today I'm going to begin with um, who is PTTEP because I see that there are um, a few um, atten attendees from abroad. You, maybe you might not know who we are. And then I'm going to um, tell you a bit more about our greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy. And then I'm going to, um, it's a promotion a little bit about our in-house CCU technology development. And then I'm going to go to the main talk about the CCU ecosystem. So um, PTTEP, uh, stands for PTT Exploration and Production. We are Thailand's national oil and gas upstream uh, production company. We are headquartered in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, right now, we are operating in 15 countries around the world. As you can see, our main uh, base of production is in Southeast Asia. We have footprint in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Vietnam and Myanmar, and quite a bit in uh, North Africa, like in Algeria and a bit in Brazil, and some in uh, some new plant is going to come up uh, in a few years in Mozambique. Our staff currently is 4,600 people. Um, for our greenhouse gas uh, target, just on Monday, two days ago, we just announced our new net zero target. So our plan is that um, compared to the base year of 2020, we will try, we will reduce our um, greenhouse gas emission intensity by 30% and 50% by 2040 and achieve net zero by 2050. The means that we do that, we have a few initiatives going ongoing. We are trying to reduce our flare utilization. We are also improving our um, efficiency in the process, which will basically reduce uh, consumption of fossil fuel and hence leads to reducing our CO2 emission. We're also introducing more renewable power energy into our production. And last but not the least, we are also studying CCUS. So um, our research of uh, CCUS at a glance, um, our, Myself, I'm from technology development department. So we are taking care of carbon capture and CCU application. We also have another team who's working on carbon capture and storage and enhanced oil recovery. But for my department and today activity, it's going to relate it, to relate it so much on turning CO2 into applications. Within PTTEP, um, we would like to um, highlight two of the higher uh, TRL projects. One is fly gas and CO2 conversion to carbon nanotube. This plant is uh, all in operation since uh, 2021. It's up in a prototype phase. And um, do you see this container? This is our um, carbon nanotube unit. It's a size of a container and is located at our Sirikit oil fields in Thailand. What we do is basically connecting our flare gas um, into this unit. And we are producing carbon nanotube. Uh, uh, the capacity of the unit is designed for 1,300 kilograms per year of carbon nanotube. Carbon nanotube is a, a very um, new, uh, exciting material. It's uh, basically has um, a special property, meaning it's really strong, but it's also lightweight. And at the same time, it has electricity um, conduct conductivity as well. And therefore, we have developed a few applications uh, from our carbon nanotube, such as um, electrodes in batteries and um, uh, plastic a polymer composite. Another uh, project that I would like to highlight is our CO2 to uh, cyclic carbonate unit. This unit is now under construction. It's located at our facility, new R&D facility in Rayong, and the unit is designed to produce 20 liter per day of uh, cyclic carbonate. So if you would 
uh, like to to visit us in our uh, facility in Leong, uh, be very happy to show you around. Now let's come into CCU ecosystem. Before we get into the main talk, just recap: Why are we doing this whole CCUS business thing? It is because of global warming effect of the planet. If you can see, I think many people already talked about it today. The global temperature is rising and, and we can see that it has a direct correlation with the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. You can see that uh, over the past, I think 200 years, the amount of CO2 increased by double, I think, now, this figure of 410 ppm was um, in 2019, and I think right now we're already at 500 ppm or so. And then what that is why it's really important for the industry like us that, um, you know, we are we consuming a lot of energy and by burning a fossil fuel, it's naturally going to re release CO2 in the atmosphere. How are we as an industry going to reduce our um, CO2 footprint? and store it or utilize it and eventually hopefully we could bring down this curve now let's come into um, co2 capture and utilization um, let's come back to um, how how we see it so when we are going to do ccu or ccs the first thing that we need to do is that we need to capture the co2 we need high purity CO2, either to storage or to convert them into any other products. So let's have a look at the journey of how CO2 exists in, in the world and how we collect them. So let's come back to the origin of everything. You see this, this is like an offshore uh, rig. It's basically very PTTEB. What we do is that we're doing exploration and production of oil and gas. And normally when you're producing gas in the gas field, it's, it's gonna come with some CO2. Some fields are lucky than other, they might not even have CO2 within their natural gases all, but some fields like in Thailand, for example, it's, it has a really high CO2 content. So after we, 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 we drill natural gas, we have natural gas plus CO2, we can't just send directly onshore to our client we need to do something called pre-combustion capture. So basically we remove CO2 from natural gas, from sour natural gas becomes sweet because CO2 is out. And then those um, sweet natural gas is sent to shore to our to downstream users. Could, it could be power plant, it could be cement plant, it could be a uh, steel plant. It could be anyone, it could be us who's turning air conditioning in our home um, with the power from the power plant, of course. But our uh, consumer uh, clients like power plants, they can also use other type of fuels. It could be coal, it could be oil, or some maybe cement plant might just use biomass as well as fuel. And by when they are generating electricity or doing refining activities, fossil fuels are burned. After the combustion process, CO2 is gonna come out in a so-called flue gas off the stack. The composition of CO2 will be much lower because when you're doing combustion, you use air, a lot of nitrogen in it, CO2 emission, 10% um, max, could be 12 even. And then normally right now, we just vent it off. And that's why a lot of CO2 ends up in the environment and the world is becoming hot. But if we are going to do CCU or CCS, we need to install a so-called post combustion capture. It could be amine scrubber, it could be um, uh, absorbent, it could be membranes, but essentially, so this unit is going to purify CO2 into a concentrated form, ready to be used in CCU or CCS unit. Another way of uh, getting high purity CO2, it's called direct air capture. Direct air capture is very special because it's taking 
CO2, that 500 ppm that I mentioned in the previous slide, take that CO2 and concentrate it then, filter it from the air, becomes a high concentration CO2. And um, these are the three major ways to do the so-called CO2 capture bit as a preparation for CO2 conversion or CCS. So now, so now that we get high purity CO2, we are going to convert them into whatever product of our desire. It could be ethylene, urea, methanol, propylene carbonate, or anything. But to be able to do so, you will need a lot of energy because CO2 is very inert and it requires a lot of direct energy input or reactant, which has a very high, high energy in itself. For example, hydrogen. And um, to doing so, it means that um, we need to be able to produce or find hydrogen to our location where we're going to do CO2 capture and to ensure that our CCU activity is actually sustainable. We need to take care of our CO2 footprint or LCA, you could say that. So if we were to do CCU with, with, you know, within our plant, we will need to ensure to use as much renewable power as possible. Otherwise, we will be ending up producing CO2 back to the environment. And when you are doing LCA calculation, it's gonna be see that your process is actually net emission of CO2 and not net re reduction of CO2. So these are the key consideration that you need to think when you would like to do CCU. Uh, this slide um, is really um, special for me. I, I really like this slide. It's a paper, you can uh, find it. Uh, this is the source. Basically, it was showing the time frame to deployment, which is basically related to the TRL of each uh, CCU technology of different uh, uh, products. So the blue dot here, it says that as of 2019, this paper said that propylene carbonate, polycarbonate, salicylic acid, urea, these are the, the CCU pathway that are already in commercialized stage. But if you're looking into the next, next ones, there are nothing else. Everything else are just in the pipeline. They are still under R&D stage. The one that is the next tier closer in terms of, of TRL, it is gonna be ready in the next five years. So uh, plus five is gonna be 2024. And the other more than half of it would take another 10 to 20 years for the technology to become mature enough for any of the industry to be able to adopt and use it in a larger scale. So what it means this page is that the journey of turning these technology into a real life application, it's going to go through a lot of investment. It's a lot of money, even to invent the chemistry itself, to scale it up to a pilot plant, or even scale further up into a demonstration scale. The money that we're talking through the whole journey until commercialization stage could be up to 100 to 200 million dollars for, for a smaller scale. In a couple of pages later, I will be, there, there will be an example. So you can see like the, uh, the significant amount and effort in trying to, to make these technologies be available. So now, now we know that um, it seems to us that we could agree today that CCU is also a good way of reducing CO2 emission, and it could be an alternative to CCS. Um, alternative, I mean, it means to me that doing CCS is more like you are spending money to store CCS on the ground. So it's very much losing money. 
But doing CCU, it's more like you're trying to capture CO2, turn it into something else, and you have some revenue offset, maybe not the whole thing, but at least it helps you quite a bit with the economics of the project. But in the previous page, I was also saying that even though we think the CCU is promising, but still the technology are too early for a large scale deployment. So I don't think in the next five to 10 years is going to contribute so much into um, CO2 reduction emission in a larger scale. Yes, and so another 10 to 15 years, everyone will have to put on huge investment to scale up and then and demonstrate these whole technologies. That's the one of already one issue. Another issue is that when you are producing the CCU product, let's say uh, if you are making ethylene or methanol, the price that you are produced is going to be so much higher than the conventional product. It could go to four, five, seven times higher. And um, so the cost of production is so high. So the, the industry would, would likely, would, would be very unlikely to, to shift to use the CCU route to produce the very same chemical anytime soon without any push. And also for the market side, there's still no requirement or no incentive for any of the buyer to, to feel like they wanted to spend more to buy cleaner products. So without any incentive for the producer to, to do something about it, nor the push from the market that they want green products, it's really, really very difficult for a CCU to actually happen in the grander scale. I mean, from what I see in the world, there are many, many uh, collaboration or so-called consortium going on, but those things actually happened only because there was a clear national policy, like in EU, for example, the national policy would be, for example, a carbon tax. So the maybe power plant, they have to pay a fine for 80 to 100 euros per ton CO2 emission. So with that push from the government, they, they might want to just spend those money instead of paying tax and do CCU or CCS that could potentially bring in revenue. So that's the push side and very much support. I mean, very much support from the government is because those tax money didn't go anywhere. It's basically coming back as a grant or support for the um, for, for all the demonstration project. Like in the EU, it has a so-called European Innovation Fund where all the CCU and CCS demonstration project can, can um, send the application and pitch for, for grant. This project, for example, is called Nord CCU Hub. It's located in Belgium in the city uh, called Ghent. Um, this collaboration is very special. Um, I've been following them for, for a year now. They are trying to make a large scale demonstration of CO2 to methanol plant. Uh, 40,000 tons a year is quite a reasonable size actually to scale up. It's a collaboration with uh, many industry. It has a CO2 emitter, it's from a steel industry and it has like a power player and it also has um, uh, this one. I think they are the biofuel company. These companies are located along a river and they basically created the project together. Basically waste CO2 from someone is sent to a methanol plant and renewable power that's come from uh, North Sea from wind farm is sent to the electrolysis plant. Uh, hydrogen is sent to the methanol plant and the oxygen is sent to other users like the steel plant or ammonia plant and um, a power plant even. And this um, collaboration in Belgium was supported by the local government and uh, a port authority of Ghent. And from what I understand by reading uh, through their websites, it seems that this project has been ongoing since 2018. And I think it happened because of a lot of funding from the government in the feasibility stage. 
And last year, they um, sent the application of this uh, demonstration project into the um, European Innovation Fund. And I, if I'm not wrong, I think they were asking for some hundred million, a hundred million something euros for fun. And I'm not too sure though what what covers, what are the scope of those funds for. But um, just a couple of weeks ago, when I went back to their website, they did not get the funding from the European uh, uh, Innovation Fund, and they were saying that um, they need to actually take a step back as a group and see how they are going to to go forward with this demonstration, you know, without funding is really hard to make it happen. So I'm just thinking, what if we want such collaboration to happen in Thailand? Uh, what can we do? So basically, I think it's very important that we set up a CZU ecosystem. It should be a group of academics and industry with the multiple players like power or us upstream, downstream, petrochem. We should be able to work together and develop a project, select one thing and do something together. And within this ecosystem, the collaboration that I was talking about, I really would like to imagine that there's another team to try to study a national policy recommendation and even provide roadmap for CCU and energy transition as a whole for, for Thailand. And another thing would be that um, I would, would love, if possible, if Thailand could have some fund, a financial support to help the industry to bring out the scale up of the technology to make a pilot plan, to make a demonstration plan, to make something that we can say that it happens in Thailand. So um, lastly, uh, this page is not for, for everyone to uh, stay focused, see what I'm actually writing on this page. It was more like there are really a lot of study for the ecosystem collaboration that we could work together and bring out the result, like what would be the impact of CCU technology, the CCU economy for, for Thailand's um, economy as a whole? Could it be actually providing a new S-curve for the country, like, you know, the next petrochem of Thailand? And I really would love that we have a result of the study as a policy recommendation, something, some way to accelerate CCUS large scale implementation in Thailand. So let's hope that we could somehow get something like this happen and have one world scale, one large scale demonstration project happen in Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much for very nice presentations. I think we have some questions. Woman, please. Uh, this is a question from. Uh, this is for SCG, the others. We, we, we then they can move it back again. So do we have any questions from the floor? Okay, let me start with one question. At the first part of your talk, you like uh, you present some things about the use of a uh, uh, flag gas and carbon dioxide, and this is used to produce a carbon nanotube. This is very interesting for me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, what I wonder is that. When we synthesize carbon dioxide, a carbon nanotube from carbon dioxide, we may need to have very high temperature like us, seven to 800 degrees Celsius, and also need to have a kind of a reducing atmosphere. So how can, how can you work, or how can you handle this kind of process and make it to be a candidate for a kind of carbon neutral process? Yeah. Uh, I think, um... Uh, first of all, I need to say that uh, 
this, uh, this project is it's not my project. I'll, I'll try to answer at my best capacity. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. I think, uh, I think the CO2 footprint will be something of uh, an optimization exercise as well. I think we will still need to um, develop it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's quite energy intensive. Intensive. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is one of the example that we can use carbon dioxide, right? Okay. Yes. So, and, and when before you end the, the talk, you mentioned something that is very interesting, CCU ecosystem. We are looking yes. forward to seeing these kinds of the, uh, the organization and we can then work together in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your nice talks and, and share your very informative information here. It's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So, I think we have the questions from the floor. Uh, this is from the from Dr. Suchada Budnak to everyone. This is quite surprising that SDG is focusing on CCS. Why PTTEP is working mainly on CCU, but both options we are ways to go for the country uh, this is a suggestion okay this is very nice okay let me, let me to that. ah this is nice okay so, so uh i guess the, the 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 reason i said that thailand should focus on ccs because it, we need to but uh SEG is also working on ccu as well and we're working on some something that converts CO2 to product that we can use directly. Yeah. So uh, it'll be part of our demonstration for the next five years. And 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 you know, as I said, you know, the CCU will be our internal focus. But we want the government to take actions on the CCS because you know it, it will be, as I said, you know, uh, I don't want to say a long hang, low hanging fruit, but you know, a, a nearer term deployment for for the carbon capture. Route. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your suggestions. Oh, another, um, another one for, for me as well, the hydrogen. <laughs> uh, oh, I think I need yeah. to say a bit on CCS as well. Okay, <laughs> I just feel like it was, it was touching on us. Oh, it's not that we're not focusing on CCS. It's just that today it's the talk about CCU. So we are preparing uh, the subject on CCU, but definitely PTTEP is, is studying on CCS because it's, you know, uh, subsurface is our kind of territory. And um, I think um, uh, sometime soon there, there might be something to be able to share, but we're still um, studying. Okay, really nice sharing from you. It, 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 it is a good, it, it is a good notice <laughs> that, you know, SEG actually should be focusing on CCU and PGTEP should be focusing on CCS and you're right. <laughs> so, so you said up already. Okay. <laughs> I hope we have one more question for discussions. Okay. Okay. So it's coming I think to I, the I, I saw a yeah. couple of a couple of questions on, oh. on hydrogen to, to me. Oh, the, yeah. the, the color and, and the, what, what we focus on. So Okay. Uh, I think the the color marks the way the hydrogen is made. It doesn't necessarily indicate the intensity. So uh, two weeks ago, I, I attended a, a conference on hydrogen standards, and exactly the same question. You know, how do, should we go by color, or should we go by uh, intensity? Because uh, let's say, for example, if 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 the the, the dirtiest one is gray. And we capture it as blue, but if we use the wrong type of energy, it's going to be dark, very, very dark blue. So it depends on as I, I think. I think you know over time, even though the the color is and easy to understand right now, uh, it will change. It will change towards a intensity of hydrogen. Okay. Professor Kajan, we have questions from Ajahn Kajan Slack. Hydrogen is your focus as well, isn't it? Isn't it? This is the question for PTTEP. 
<laughs> I think more of they focus on hydrogen. They yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, let me respond to you to the other one. So so I I I think the way the industry looks at hydrogen is in two two ways. One, where can we source it? So if we want to source it, we want to look source green and blue. But if we want to produce it, then if you want to produce green hydrogen, you need a lot of renewable energy, which is a problem for Thailand at the moment. You know, renewable is it's it, you know, we, we don't have a lot. In Vietnam, it's a different story. Or if you want to produce blue, where would the CO2 go? So if there's a there's a you know consortium of something that comes out to look at the carbon sequestration, I'm sure that you know the company like uh, the gas company Linde and BIG and everybody will be jump, jumping on the blue hydrogen train. But for me, for me personally, personally, I, I can't say that it is going to be the thing that SCG will focus on is the turquoise hydrogen. Because as I mentioned, it produces hydrogen that we can use and produce a carbon black that can can go into our black products as well. So it 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 it, it forms a nice kind of va uh, fits into the value chain a bit more nicely than other options. Yeah. Any other Thank questions you. from Dr. Kajan Sak or anyone? So, so Dr. Kajan also, I mean, you want to answer? I don't know if hydrogen is also in your port as well i mean please open uh please turn on i forgot to unmute myself yeah. so um actually i am uh looking into a portfolio of ccu a new business on ccu so to me it's unavoidable that i have to touch on hydrogen right <laughs> <laughs> it's really unavoidable. And doing CCU at the beginning, I thought, you know, as a chemical engineer, I think it's quite nice. You know, it's going to use my well, chemical knowledge bits. But no, when you're doing CCU, you're going to look at hydrogen, you're going to look at renewable power. And at some point, you need to understand LCA. So coming back to hydrogen, yes, we're interested in hydrogen. Um, but PD, as a, for CCU, as a user, so we care a lot of the origins of hydrogen, the the whole 50 shades of, of, of green, gray, and blue hydrogen. Um, but when it comes to the whole uh, portfolio as a whole, so we're looking into hydrogen as a new form of energy. So it's a cleaner energy, and the ways of doing hydrogen is definitely um, through um, electrolysis. It's definitely green hydrogen. And um, another thing would be uh, blue hydrogen. I think this is where PTDEP could could help others because blue hydrogen definitely it's uh, an SMR, right? And then you're gonna have CO2. And to turn it blue, you gotta store it. So I think it's is very much again come, come to us uh, unavoidably. Yes. We sure. will play sure. roles in blue <laughs> hydrogen. Okay, it's understandable. So I have two thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean after uh this <laughs> seminar, maybe CCU people will go I don't know, gardening or planting go to the forest and start working on CCU maybe. Uh, do you have any, you know, uh, can you encourage them? I mean, the CCU people, if if they are still um, working in, in, in this direction, uh, any suggestion or, or whatever? Yeah. Uh, who should we start from? Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, we will go to the, you know, hydrogen technology. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I think for me, uh, carbon dioxide utilization is still an open question. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you know, di di different industry would need different CCU technology. For example, let 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 me let me let me put a perspective on SCG and where, and how we we communicate internally. So, for example, let, let's say you know take take a reaction. Uh, Fischer-Tropp reaction. If you look at Fischer-Tropp reaction, it's more fitting to petrochemical and oil and gas because it goes back to the feed. It goes back to energy. But if if if, if you do that in SCG cement and building materials, first of all, you know where is hydrogen going to come from? Second of all, they not they 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 don't have the facility to use the the final product within their battery limit. So that means that it creates another problem for them. 
so but by saying that, I, I guess, you know, there is still an open questions of what technology would fit on the U side. The capture side is it's easy. I mean, everybody goes to aiming first yeah. and that's a couple of startups yeah. that would aim to improve that. A couple of, you know, a, a lot of groups around the world are using, you go to solid oxides, uh, go to solid as problem, using MOF, using everything. So I think the capture side is, is also very exciting. But utilization is, if, if my first recommendation is what kind of scale do you want to work at? A million ton or a thousand tons. If it's a thousand ton, electrochemistry might be good. A million ton, probably nowhere. Not today. Yeah? Yes. So I think I think that that's the first cut point. So who who de define the the, the scale? The, let's say that the customers and the emitters of who you want to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. Then define the technology. Then define probably the uh, the 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 roadblocks of your technologies. Just ask this question. I'm not encouraging not to do it. You know, please do it. But you know, ask this question <laughs> along the way of, of thank of, you at least. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. I really like to add on to uh, Kun Butra's point. You know, uh, we were trying to study on uh, like CO two mineralization, right? And the first thing that came to my mind was that I was really thinking about you guys, SCG. In Salaburi, for example. <laughs> and and the plant that I was trying to work on was in Kampang Pit. Hmm. And I was like, I really need like some mineral sources. And I'm looking around, I'm like, um, can I do something with Salaburi Gang? I mean <laughs> you know, it's really an issue matching all those uh, jigsaws within the boundary. And and if I I wanted to do something in Kampang Pet, it's middle of nowhere, there's no hydrogen for me. How where am I gonna get it? And, and hydrogen is one part, right? And if I say like, fine, I, I, I'll produce my own hydrogen, then you, you want to go green, you want to go like full blown renewables, right? How many, you know, square kilometers of land you need to acquire? And if you're lucky, okay, if you're lucky enough to get sufficient land, right? The sun comes up like six hours a day. What are you going to do with the rest of the day? Battery? It's going to cost like the, the cost is going to go up so high. Yeah. So a lot of things that need, we need to solve. And not just and the same, chemistry yeah. itself, everything around it. And also, same, same goes with SEG cement as well. You know, I, they, they, they're in Saraburi. So they are very, very far from the sea. So CPS <laughs> for them is also difficult. <laughs> so, you know, as I said, you know, it, it's, it, it's turning to be a good, you know, uh, round table talk. <laughs> Yeah. It's a good time. <laughs> yeah. so, so we need um ecosystem. So <laughs> I think so. Mm. Maybe consult it. Yeah, you, you can submit and start it soon. Yeah. Okay. So back to you, Ka, for Dan Meta. Ka, okay, Ka. So so it's uh coming to the end of the the talk and these sessions. I would like to say something. This is uh, the increase in carbon dioxide emission in the atmosphere is a global concern that requires urgent solution to achieve net zero emission. In response to global warming concern, this international conference carbon capture and utilization toward carbon neutral economies hosted by National Science and Technology Development Agency to review new technology for carbon dioxide capturing and utilizing in industrial production process brought together expert and researcher from academia and researcher at uh, sorry and industry to share the current situation and discuss the solution for this complex carbon dioxide capturing and utilizing utilizing problems Last but not least, on behalf of the organizing committee, we hope that this seminar will help initiate and facilitate the urgent solutions to achieve net zero emission in their futures. And I would like to take this opportunity to give sincere thanks to our speakers again. And from this moment, I would like to uh, hand the session back to Dr. Supavadi, please. Yeah. So I actually we end um, all the session um 
And Atal Meta already give like closing remark. Can I think it's, it's it's already okay for for the closing session. And um for the last um I'm not sure that um is there any um one that still not do the the survey for us. If I ask Sung Nan to show the um, slide again for um. Completing the, the the survey for us. <laughs> 